And at that point, I had about five or six guys to my front, you know, two or three off to my left and rear. But I, I figured that uh, Nate and Drew were going to have to sort this out. And I, I'd buy them as much time as I could. So I just started advancing all the enemy with my pistol out. Every time I would line up my sights and, and break around, I just figured it would be my last one. And then as I got, you know, close that gap with them and started running my pistol closer to empty and uh, having effect on the enemy. But then I got right there in the middle of them and my pistol only had like two rounds left in it. I was surprised that I wasn't dead and the Taliban was uh, super upset. So to so buy some time for all of us to kind of think about what we're gonna do next, I, I pulled out a hand grenade and uh, tossed it in between us. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit and I serve war zone tours as an army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we have a once in a lifetime combat story with one of the few living Medal of Honor recipients from the war in Afghanistan, Earl Plumley. Earl was a Marine infantryman, force recon team leader, and special forces weapons sergeant in the pre and mainly post 9-11 era. Earl would deploy multiple times with the Marine Corps and the Army to include combat deployments with Force Recon and a historic deployment in 2013 with his ODA where he would earn the Medal of Honor. In this episode, we touch on both of Earl's recon deployments, but spend a considerable amount of time walking through the battle in which he earned the Medal of Honor and in which his fellow Green Berets earned their medals for valor. It's an amazing story to hear firsthand that includes a coordinated and lethal attack of a U.S. installation in Ghazni, Afghanistan, suicide bombers, injured Americans, and several Green Berets who had never fought together, operating as one element to repel the attack. Earl's work during this assault is amazing and almost impossible to imagine he didn't get more gravely wounded. He had over 300 rounds of enemy fire directed at him from very close range, dozens of grenades lobbed his way, and suicide vests detonating meters away from his position. He now speaks out about civic duty and service and provides motivational and public speaking for customers around the world. Please enjoy this selfless story of a rare and living Medal of Honor recipient with Earl Plumley. Earl, thanks so much for taking the time to share your story with us today. Hey, you know, great to be here, man. Pleasure. So I think the first question here is just what's it like in the day in the life or a week in the life of a Medal of Honor recipient? I imagine you're busy and they got you on the road. Well, it's it's amazing to me the lack of respect a lot of people um, have for a Medal of Honor recipient. My wife made me take the trash out this morning, first thing, <laughs> and then I mop the kitchen. So... If we could educate people on, on how recipients should be treated, uh, that would be great. It's interesting. But, uh, but it's it's a, a very thing. You know, I just retired, so my uh, just getting used to being a uh, non-serving recipient way way less exciting than being a, a Green Beret uh, recipient. But uh, you know, I pretty normal. Kick around the house. Um, I do obviously get invited to. Uh, probably 10 events a day all over the country to um, speak on behalf of um, veterans and uh, in the, the country. And I just kind of, I got to pick where I invest my time and I try to spend as much time as I can being a cool dad. Because they, you know, I already spent 25 years not being a very cool dad. So uh, I'm trying to fix that. How, just out of curiosity, I'm, I'm, how old are the kids and how cool do they think it is that you have this honor? Or does it not even register with them yet? Uh, it, it registers. So my kids are, my son's nine and my daughter's 13. Um, and they go back and forth between it, it, is it a cool thing or not? Uh, my son, super over it. Because uh, he, he uh, you know, what nine-year-old wants to go to formal dinners? Yeah, none. Yeah. And, uh, and he's heard, you know, he's heard my narrative story. Probably He can probably tell it. Yeah. And he's, and he's just like, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, but you know, I did get invited to speak at their schools for events and, um, you know, that's, they're obviously pumped about that. That's great. I know him. Yeah. All right. And you're also just for those who are listening and can't see you, I mean, you're sitting in your basement, you got some, you got some cool stuff up on the wall, but you're also smoking a cigar. Um, well, just so you know, once again, a lack of respect on behalf of my wife for recipients, I'm only allowed to smoke in this room in my basement. Nowhere else. As a matter of fact, if I even have a, have it lit and I open this door right over here, all hell breaks loose in this house. <laughs> Is that the uh, the award behind you, kind of tucked in there? Yeah, I usually keep it. Um, 
on hand. Well, I usually keep it the same because yeah. that's the, every recipient gave me the same, uh, similar three different order piece of advice. Uh, don't lose your metal being one of the uh, main focuses, but I usually <laughs> keep it the safe so that awesome. you know, some random person that breaks into my house doesn't uh, run off and uh, end up meeting an FBI agent over yeah. a, a B and E. What uh, What are the other two pieces of advice? They said, if- uh, "Learn to say no and uh, watch your drinking." Interesting. Because, uh, obviously, uh, you don't really have to pay for your drinks. And uh, uh, that can get out of hand and uh, learn to say no, because especially, uh, um, yeah, I think every Medal of Honor recipient has kind of the same, uh, Kyle Carpenter calls it the beautiful burden. And uh, they hate to say no to, th- to things, um, especially when it's like, when it's your service asking, DOD related, um, veterans community, uh, it's hard to say no to those things. And, uh, yeah, that's so. Anyway, they all told me like learn to say no. You know, do do some good, and then uh, what's the point? Uh, and get the medal uh, if you're alive. If you're just going to throw that the rest of your life away, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, you know, when you have you know Sammy Davis, um, Drew Diggs, like you know, legendary medal of honor recipients. Like, hey man, it's okay if you uh, just hang out at your house for weeks at a time. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, that probably means a lot coming from them. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What does it take to get something of yours up in the, the living room in the house? Like, what are you going to have to come back with to, <laughs> to get out of the corner of your basement? Uh, I probably need a new wife because uh, like <laughs> like my buddy Robin here, she, she too does not smoke or enjoy the smell of cigars. So I, <laughs> I don't it. know how it's going to work. Got it. Hey, I, I wanted to jump back to uh, to Oklahoma and you growing up. I feel like probably the way you described uh, your kids growing up around uh, the Northwest might be a little bit different from what I understand was not the the easiest upbringing you may have had. And I was hoping you could take us through that. Yeah, so I grew up in Western Oklahoma. Um, my family owned a, uh, a cattle ranch. Uh, and then we also worked in the oil field so that we could afford to uh, lose money on a cattle ranch. But yeah, I, you know, I grew up, um, you know, supporting those endeavors wherever I could. Uh, when I was young, obviously, you know, building fence and feeding feeding cattle, and uh, you know, later uh, running oil field parts uh, all over uh, Texas and Oklahoma. Which uh, I have my you know my big one. I, I go back uh, to Oklahoma and uh, talk to kids who are interested in serving, and I was like, hey, if you're on the fence because of the uh, adversity of service, uh, they're actually that's a that's a national campaign. They're not talking to you. So if you're if you're building river gaps in, in February in Oklahoma, uh, the army is not that hard. The army is a lot easier than what you're doing now. So uh, so true. Come on down. So I, I gained forty pounds in boot camp. <laughs> Being forced to sleep eight hours and eat three meals a day uh, had a profound effect on my health. What What were some of the harder things you were doing labor wise? Um, I, well, you know, it depends on what's going on. Um, every, pretty much all winter, um, you know, I'd, I'd have to get up um, early and get out and we, uh, we call it cutting ice, but we have to go cut the ice out of all of our stock tanks so that the, the cattle could drink. And uh, depending on what was going on, you might have to do that before bed too. And uh, I, I know it's very popular, the cold plunges now. Uh, I didn't know about the health benefits. Of you were way ahead of your time. And, uh, uh, douche and ice water for, uh, before breakfast, but you know apparently it may, maybe that helped with the robustness of my physicality. Um, and then you know the we had a river bottom land, uh, so we had a uh, river gaps that were just constantly washing out, and uh, they never wash out on a nice day. It's always you know the sheriff would call us at or two or three in the morning. Hey, your cows are all over the highway, so we have to go get them back onto our property and then build a, a fence. And then when the sun came up, you know, we'd go to school. Did you feel like you missed out on a, a on a normal childhood or did you just not know any better? I, I, mean, I feel like better. most people had it way, way easier yeah. than you. All my friends were doing the same thing. So I didn't, I didn't know that, um, you know, people got bored uh, <laughs> when they were children. I, it never occurred to me that that would happen. <clears throat> but I called, you know, bored was like resting. And I hope my dad didn't know that I was resting because he would always find uh, something for me to do. 
where where did his desire to have a farm or a ranch come from? So he he grew up on the uh, uh, Wagner Ranch in Texas, and um, you know did those same things, but on somebody else's land. So he he always had a really um, a deep desire to own his own property and run his own cattle, because uh, you know his his childhood was similar to mine, except for it was somebody else's fence and somebody else's cattle. So. Uh, I think he, if he, he, he wanted to, if you're going to do that, I want to do it for myself. And then everybody, you know, I don't know if you met anybody from Texas. They all think they're cattle ranchers, whether, whether they got, uh, you know, 5,000 cattle or a couple of T-bones in their the freezer. They all, they all think they're cattlemen. So would you see yourself doing that in the future? So that was literally my plan was my retirement plan was a cattle ranch in Texas. Um, but I made a promise to my wife, you know, she had to follow me around and, and um, you know, live here when I was deployed all the time. So I promised her when we retired that, that she could live anywhere she wanted. And uh, anyway, uh, she called an audible. So about a year and a half ago, we quit looking for cattle ranches in Texas to buy. And we started looking at uh, beautiful homes in Florida. <clears throat> so I did a bunch of military engagements in Florida. And they, they used to sneak her off. Uh, brilliant play on behalf of the government and business <laughs> of Florida. They, they take my wife off on little side excursions and showed her all these beautiful homes and great school districts. And uh, anyway, I retired and I found out we're moving to Florida. You know, oh, they made a liar over uh, a promise I made. So, Got it. Got it. Um, how about how about the relationship with your old man or your family? Just how tight was that? I got to imagine working like that, you get pretty dang close. Yeah, I mean, uh, and you know, I still, you know, talk to my father all the time, and we st- we tell the same stories. My kids probably hate it. It's, uh, we tell the same, uh, you know, you know, reliving that adversity and and you know, marveling that we survived things. Uh, like my uh, my house got hit by a tornado when I was probably fourteen, and uh, that was my my stepmother, my father, myself, uh, my brother, little brother. He had gone to a church social, so made me appreciate church more. Because the only person that didn't get to survive a tornado was because they went to church. <laughs> uh, how about how about the history of military service in the family? So we we have a we're a military family. Um, you you have to you know you. You, you can't find anybody that hasn't served. Uh, so we, we have our little uh, almanac or the, the paintings of nobility or the Plumley family. And uh, we've, uh, we've served in the military since the uh, French and Indian Wars. So we kind of got a little hey. Lieutenant Dan that's going on. Was your dad, did your dad serve in? Uh, so my dad was a, a Marine and it, it basically mirrored our careers. Uh, so I guess that's just our thing is he did, he did a, uh, a tour in the Marine Corps and then joined the army. And I did the same thing. So like, that's, that's a plumbly thing. We, we can't decide what we want to be when we grow, we grow up. Well, just before we jump into why you joined up, I guess the name Earl, I don't hear often. Um, I'm curious, where does that come from? Uh, Grandpa Earl. My, my dad had a, um, a relative. He wasn't my grandfather, but we called him Grandpa Earl. And uh, my dad, he was a, uh, no cattlemen in Oklahoma, uh, shrewd businessman. Also, my dad looked up to him and I got, got named after him. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. But I'm always, you know, I never got a nickname in the army. I never got, got a nickname in the ring court because nobody has ever met an Earl. So everybody else gets cool nicknames and I just get, I'm Earl. <laughs> um, all right. When you make the decision to serve, is there any, is there any concern you're, you're not sticking around to help out on the ranch? Or was the expectation yeah, to get, I mean, get out? So my my dad really, um, he was a first generation landowner, and that's like the make it or break it, you know, because um, you really don't you don't make any money in, until that land's paid off. So, you know, he was he was kind of grunting through it, and his you know his dream, his aspiration was to take this land and you know build like that di- that Yellowstone dynasty where every generation added some property, and we ended up having, you know, 110,000 acre ranch. Um, unfortunately, uh, I wanted to have military adventures and I astutely observed that I would be a ranch hand until my father died <laughs> and, uh, and decided that the military 
uh, life was for me. And you know, also I, I also had some uh, I had some problems getting out during a time of war. I just really uh, had to grapple with that, and, and I decided not to. So uh, told my wife, we're, we're not leaving here till the war's over. I didn't know it was going to last for 21 years when I made that kind of yeah. line in the sand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Um, what was the decision to to join up? I'm sure you could have gone and done other things, but I always, I, I don't remember a time when it wasn't my plan. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, as I kind of figured out who I was, it kind of shows where I was headed. Um, you know, for a while, uh, I wanted, you know, I wanted to be a top cat pilot. You know, Top Gun style. Top Gun does it. Yeah, and I uh, realized that uh, I don't like being inside. <laughs> and uh, I have extreme uh, what, ADHD or hyperactivity or something. Anyway, uh started discovering that I liked being outside and uh, I wanted to serve and uh, ended up in the infantry um, with aspirations of doing you know other things and, and this kind of Took it one step at a time and ended up being a force recon Marine. And yeah. then obviously, you know, jumping off, jumping ship from the Marine Corps and, and uh, becoming a Green Beret. How about, uh, you know, occasionally folks will have some sleight of hand from a recruiter. What was your experience? Uh, and did you just go straight to the Marine recruiter? I, I went straight to the, well, he came to me because uh, yeah. at that time, the, only the Marine recruiter would come to the jail. Uh, so I come on, no, all right, I, rewind that one. What's yeah. this story? Uh, well, you know, we, me and a bunch of my buddies got in some trouble. That was I had two profound mentors that helped me decide to serve in the military. And it was the the sheriff and district attorney in Beckham County. <laughs> but they they agreed to drop all the charges if uh, uh, and I my thing is I think they were all laughing. Uh, not when I was in the room, they're like, all right, this is kind of funny, but. Seriously, these are all these are all felonies with significant time. If it was a you know a, another situation, so let's get this kid out of here. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, the Marine recruiter came down and they were like, "All right, we're not we're not doing any charges." And it was one of those you know you have to the charges have to be deferred before they can they can you can sign papers. So they were like, "All right, little shell game," and I signed my stuff and uh, joined the infantry. If I mean, if it had been an army recruiter, would you have just gone with with that path? Um. Well, no, because I'm stubborn, so I, I'd already kind of okay. decided to be a marine. So I'd have been like, no, <laughs> I'm gonna hold out here for a minute. But yeah, I mean, I would have, I would have gone to the army too. I guess. Yeah. I just, um, you know, the, the Marine Corps has the biggest trick ever. It's the biggest psyop, and I'm not sure how they built it. But if your father was a marine. And he tells you to join the Marine Corps, you will. If your if your father was Marine and he tells you don't join the Marine Corps, well, it's because he doesn't think that you're hard enough to, to follow his footsteps. So to prove him wrong, you join the Marine Corps. You're going in anyway. Yeah. yeah. You know, before we hit record, you were talking about one of the things that's near and dear to your heart, just the recruiting gap that we have today. Yeah. One of the things is. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I don't look at it all the time, but the Marine Corps is not that they don't aren't missing their numbers. I don't think they're not missing their numbers. and they're not offering bonuses either. That's the thing that the dress blues is the bonus. <clears throat> and uh, I, I think all the services uh, learn a little bit from how the Marine Corps does it. Um, but those bonuses, man, I, I, I really think and having taken them, it creates a lot of inequity in the service. Um, when one guy gets a bonus and another doesn't, and, uh, it's, it's never a fair thing. And I think the, uh, um, I, I think it's just a bad look, um, as a, as a means to attract recruits. If you get a highly technical job, it's going to, it's going to cost us a million dollars to replace you. Let's talk about, you know, uh, keeping you right with uh, your civilian counterpart. But, um, I, I think once we started out bonuses and then everybody's kind of, playing poker with the, the DOD. I'm like, well, I'm not going to join now. There's no bonus. Um, I, I dislike it. And just before we jump into kind of your career here, Earl, let's talk just a little bit about what you were mentioning before we hit record, just about the recruiting gap and what you see. Just, I, I think because you mentioned some of yeah. the politics there and you're going to go on to serve under 
multiple administrations. That's so I think setting idea. the groundwork is good here. Yeah, I mean, uh, they, so I, you know, I hear people all the time. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not serving under this administration, and I'm not letting my family serve under this administration, and and uh, I don't like that either. So either you're, either you're here and you're a patriot and you want to uh, support and defend the country, um, or you're not. You know, like. Just because you don't get your way from one one political issue to the next is not a reason to throw the whole country away. Um, and then, you know, the same people that make those kind of decisions um, that think they're really making a difference by not showing up for us, they're still living in the country that's protected by the military that they won't serve. So uh, to me, that's like the um, the worst kind of hypocrite. You know, if you're, if you're like a far lefty and you just think that the military in general is bad and, and we don't need it. I think you're a crazy person. Um, but uh, to admit that we need the military, that we have real enemies, um, but, uh, you know, that there's a transgender person wearing the wrong clothes because the president decided that. Um, I'm like, you know, cool, don't work for that person. You know, but, but we have an entire vast enterprise. And uh, I don't think Iran and China are, are losing any sleep at night. Uh, over a, this divisive issue that we have. Yeah. Um, as you joined up, especially under the conditions you mentioned with the uh, district attorney. Yeah. <laughs> what did you think? What did you think you were going to get out of this career? And did you think it was going to be 25 years when you punched out? I didn't think it was going to be 25 years. I, I just wanted to go and, and have an adventure. Uh, I, I wanted to achieve something on my own. Um, and, uh, Improve myself, you know, or not improve myself to my family. Um, because we have, you know, we have this veteran um, family and they all serve. And, and every, you know, Thanksgiving or Christmas, all the veterans would have their own little place and they tell their little war stories. And I wanted to be like, I want to be counted as a man in my, in my family. So, you know, I had a, a couple of things to prove. And also, you know, I, I'd seen all, all of Western Oklahoma, it's flat and there's grass. And I, I thought maybe it'd be cool to see some of the rest of the, of the earth. Yeah. Where, where do they send you for basic? Do you go West or East? From Oklahoma? So I was, uh, I was everybody West of the Mississippi goes West. <clears throat> so I, I went to Marine Corps recruit depot, San Diego. All right. And, uh, so yeah, platoon 2063, my senior drill instructor was, uh, staff sergeant Maya. Every time I climb a rope now, I still, it still leaps unbidden from my lips. So <laughs> you can still remember it, that name. Yeah. What? Yeah, I mean, and I'm like, I've every rope I've ever climbed. When I get to the top, that wants to come out of my out of my mouth. When I went to selection, I climbed a rope and uh, you know slapped the beam at the top of the rope, and I'm like, yeah, twenty sixty three, seven hundred miles, and then climbed down the rope. Um, what is what's your take on the uh, the Hollywood Marine stereotype? What, you mean like being the best? I mean, I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, so you mentioned like maybe you hadn't gotten out of Oklahoma quite as much as maybe others. You show up on the West Coast. You're there with people from all over this country. What was that like for you those first few weeks? Oh, well, if, uh, we didn't know. So nothing really profound. Uh, you don't notice the change while you're there. But uh, I guess my the funniest thing I can think of is at the end of boot camp, you made all these friends, right? And you got your little crew. And the funniest thing you'll ever see is uh, brand new military buddies hitting the street and spilling clothes for the first time. Because uh, it it is a uh, it's a beautiful thing because you know all these guys from from the Bronx to you know Beckham County, Oklahoma, and uh, you know Seattle and Detroit, they all got their own look. And then you guys are ready to hit the town together, and it and it looks like somebody is formatting a bad joke you know there's a cowboy a freaking rapper it's so true a, you know, a jazz musician and they all walk into a bar <laughs> oh geez because you haven't seen each other in civilian clothes right but like, you're what? tight you're like this guy's this this is my dude he and i you know we're right here i know this is this is my brother from another mother and then you you show up and you're like dude what the hell are you wearing like, what the hell are you wearing <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're getting dinner in LA. We're not herding cattle. 
Jeez. Just a quick word from our sponsor, Mad Rabbit, and we'll get right back to this combat story. Many of our longtime listeners will not be surprised to hear that I do not have any tattoos, but it is something I think about, and I'm often envious of some of the tattoos I see out there, especially for the guests on our show. Turns out 30% of Americans are sporting tattoos. That number jumps to 40% for folks under 35. That's a lot of ink stories walking around. This podcast is brought to you by the Wizards at Mad Rabbit, who are on a mission to make tattoo aftercare not just a routine, but a ritual. What I love about Mad Rabbit, beyond that I can use it to make my own uninked skin look great, is the founding story. It was conjured up by two ink enthusiasts who decided that the world needed something better for tattoo care. They crafted a simple, effective, and all-natural lineup that keeps your tattoos looking sharp and vibrant, like they've just been inked. Their tattoo balm sells every 90 seconds, and it's not just for fresh ink. It breathes new life into old tattoos and caters to all skin types. Now is the time to try out Mad Rabbit. They've preserved over 3 million tattoos, and they've got an exclusive offer just for Combat Story listeners. If you go to madrabbit.com and use promo code COMBATSTORY25, you'll receive 25% off. That's 25% off when you head to madrabbit.com slash COMBATSTORY25 and use our promo code combat story two five. And now back to this combat story. How about, uh, how about that graduation though? Just given that your, your old man was a Marine, did that, did family make it out? Was that oh, like yeah. a special moment? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, the Marine Corps nails that, that piece, uh, that transition. And then that, you know, presenting you back to your family, uh, as a Marine, they had, I, I haven't heard this. Or, can you talk about that? I haven't yeah, ever dug into this uh so they you know it's it's a uh, a the whole first third of boot camp all you do is is learn drill and ceremony and and how to properly uh wear the uniform and uh so when they come out you know you do a you, you do a uh a march on the parade field and get in formation and and graduate pretty easy but for you it's like a i have this new thing i can march in a really straight line uh, in step with the people next to me, um, but that's your that's your, your but your family sitting there ringside watching you come in, and they see that transition, you know, and uh, and the Marine Corps like sells it, everything you did, uh, really bragging on you to your family, and then they you know, hey, you sent us your son, we're giving you back a Marine, and, uh, and everybody in the audience is like, hell yeah, I, I still go catch a Marine Corps graduation every now and then, just uh, just to get a little adrenaline going. Yeah, I mean, I just like seeing it, and, you know, see, see a 19-year-old kid, uh, you know, weighs 145 pounds, uh, barely filling out his blouse, but walking around with his chest out. It's Could you tell now. that you had changed at all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I felt like I changed a lot. Uh, I think that was a more gradual process uh, yeah. that happened. And, and every time I came back on leave... Uh, and hang out with my friends from high school, you know, like golf widened. Um, but, you know, by the time I've been in eight, eight, 10 years, like, um, we didn't have anything in common. You know, I was like, yeah. Oh, you know, all my, all my friends with the, the people I served with, which, uh, you know, brought into stark contrast something I found out. You ever heard that old saying, um, blood's thicker than water? Do you know the full saying? It's a, it's a Roman I saying. I don't. I don't. So the blood of the battlefield is thicker than the water of the womb. So your, your actions in life uh, more closely align you um, with your brothers than people you share yeah. um, DNA with. Your actions in life are more profound than your uh, than your birthplace. I love it. I, I did too. I was like, that's exactly what I've been trying to. I've been feeling that. Yeah. How do you say it? This is yeah. What does that mean? And you know, some Roman legion figured that out. You know, two thousand years ago. How do you? What advice did your dad give you? And, and now, correct me if I'm wrong, but Earl, this is pre 9 11, right? Just it's pre a couple years before. Uh, you know, he's like, hey, uh, you know, volunteer for everything, um, be that guy. And uh, because he wanted me to be an officer. So he's like, you want to be dependable, and we're going we're gonna to do a green to gold package for you. <laughs> he already had it mapped out. Yeah, yeah. So that's a, you know, that's a thing. You know, I had a, a my father as a mentor, I disregarded everything he said. Um, other than that, sons I do. I sons do. Yeah, because, uh, um, but, you know, I, I had a, I started, I was like, oh, I'm going to be an officer. So, you know, my two years in or three years in is that the first time where you kind of get to choose that next point. And 
I was like, I don't want to be an officer. Like, look at that poor bastard. <laughs> he's he's missed to do that. Yeah. I was like, I want to be uh, a force recon marine. So I, you know, um, I went and did that, you know, which is, you know, it was a dual conversation because my dad was like, oh, be an officer or come back to the ranch, you know, and, and uh, like, I'm not, I'm not doing either. Wow. And, and even though I didn't stay there, as I became a force reconnaissance marine, I was like, this is, this is my thing. And I, I, I think I might, I'm going to run this all the way in. So, you know, and my dad's like, you know, getting older. He's like, are you coming back? And I'm like, not for, uh, you know, 16, 17, four years. Do you think he understood that? I don't think he believed me until later. Yeah. It, it didn't sound like it was um, contentious necessarily. No, I think he was, I think he was, you know, and he, he was still waiting to, for my little brother to maybe take up that mantle. And, and uh, eventually, he, you know, he had to sell it all. And uh, he moved into a smaller house and, and uh, you know, things became what they are. Yeah, fair. I, I know um, you do a couple rotations downrange, and I want to start digging into a little bit of this. Can you take us, Earl, to the first time you're, you're downrange on a deployment? Um, well, yeah, so I deployed like a week or two after 9-11. And at the, at the time, you know, the, I mean, when 9-11 happened, we all packed up to go to war. And then the where, next, where were you at at the time? I was in 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines. Uh, on a, a unit deployment program in Okinawa. So home station was Hawaii, but I was in Okinawa. So for 9-11 for us was in the middle of the night, 10, 11 o'clock at night or something. And uh, cause I remember we were all drinking beer and you know, we had like one TV for the whole platoon. Of course. And it had like the news on and we were, so we were all like, what the hell? <laughs> we all got packed up and you know, guys are sharpening their e-tools and getting their ruck swat and, and uh, we had a formation the next day and we didn't go to war. Uh, we didn't, you know, they don't, the expectations of a 20 year old man are, you know, a little bit offset from how the real world works. But, uh, but I did get put on a, a list and, and we deployed, you know, mission top secret destination unknown. And uh, unfortunately, you know, they had, they had elite special operation units to lead the charge into Afghanistan, but they didn't have, anybody to uh guard the support vessels and the ports to support that invasion and that's the job i got got it <laughs> I, I guarded a u.s merchant marine vessel uh in typical marine corps uh fashion uh, they we flew in sandbags and built fighting positions on all the ships and that's that's where i was at you know you mentioned that uh, they got these elite units going in obviously one of them are the ho- horse soldiers and the sf guys yeah. you know I still remember just reading about them, you know, on the, in the newspaper and watching TV. Did any of that start registering for you? Is that, was there a little oh. bit of a glimmer of that's pretty cool. Maybe that's oh, in my future. That trip, I was like, ah, oh. you know, cause uh, one of the vessels we supported was the carrier that had all of the, uh, the, the JSOC guys on it with the, the 160 at Burns and like crap, you know, I'm not, I'm nowhere, I'm nowhere near positioned right to, to get involved in this war. And uh, my, my, my second deployment was to support the, the Joint Special Operations Task Force in, in the Southern Philippines. But once again, you know, I was a, I was a foundations guy, you know, guarding the gate, guarding um, the barracks, you know, supporting the, the operators down there so they could do their job, which was um, very important work. And, uh, a noble and dutiful thing. I just, you know, <laughs> if they're making, if they make a movie of my life, that's going to be a short montage. It's not going to be the main part, <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to, you know, I wanted that, uh, to be the main effort, you know, yeah. I, I wanted the important, um, work and I wanted to be that guy leading the charge. And, you're, uh, you're probably so think, rubbing elbows though, with some of these special ops guys, even in the Philippines, I would imagine. At the yeah. Base. I mean, we, uh, yeah, I saw them all the time. And, you know, they were actively recruiting us. And at that time, I was still, I was still a little stuck up and snooty. I was a Marine. So I was like, SF guy, gross. You guys <laughs> don't even know to shave every day. I'm not doing that. <laughs> so I ran off and threw a 4 Street Comrade instead. 
when do you start that process to go recon? Um, that was uh, 2004. Um, okay. I went to a, a screener. We got selected into a program that was, uh, anyway, it was like an 18 month, um, you got a shot at um, getting the MOS. I and mean, if you did that, you were pipelining through cool, all the cool schools. And uh, I didn't know that that was like a super unique thing. Because after I you know, got to level two and they're like, you, how many schools have you been to? I was like, every school they got. <laughs> because all I did for 18 months was go to schools. Um, and then uh, ended up deploying in, in 2005 with uh, um, as, a, as a force reconnaissance group. And it was finally, you know, yeah, the cool, cool stuff. Yeah, like the helicopter used to come and land um, like right at where we lived. I'd like walk out of my can and out on the street and get on a helicopter and, and fly to somebody's house and ruin their day. So you're like, this is for real now. Okay, this is for real now. Yeah. How? Who did you just making that transition? Who did you talk to, if anyone, about going recon? I uh, well, I talked to my dad. He told me not to do it. Um, <laughs> So for sure you're gonna do it. Um, yeah, so I'm like, yep, I'm out of here. Because uh, my dad at this point is starting to, you know, casualties are starting to come home, and uh, and and he, you know, I think he's we're kind of reticent about encouraging me to to be there because he's like, man, like not everybody is coming home uh, how we sent them. You know, they're coming back um, missing arms and legs, and sometimes in caskets, and so. Uh, um, and you know, my dad butted up against the Vietnam conflict. So the force reconnaissance guys there, some of those units, um, were taking 60, 70% casualties. Jeez. Um, that was kind of a, you know, famous for their, their ability to absorb those kind of uh, casualties and, and still uh, come back as a, as a resilient unit. And they're like, you know, three man and right back out there. So, he, you know, he told me not to do it. Of course, you know, I went, drove right over the, uh, Force Recon compound. There was a <clears throat> grumpy old mean son of a bitch in the parking lot by the name of Dave Hutton. And uh, <clears throat> I was like, I want to be a Force Recon Marine. Like, you and everybody else, you know, <laughs> get in the truck. <laughs> <laughs> it was that quick? It wasn't like come back in a couple weeks? <clears throat> uh, no, he, they brought me in. I got uh, all my paperwork lined out. I always had to get all the way out of the infantry. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, within two weeks of me walking in there, they threw me in the pool to see if I could swim. And I was in the quiz in the infantry. So they were like, oh, jackpot. <clears throat> That's the hardest thing about it is they find a guy that can swim so that this saves on training time. Like, this guy doesn't drown when he's supposed to. Um, so this is a worthy investment. And uh, left infantry did, did the recon indoctrination platoon and uh, went to school right after that. You seem, I guess, just from the stories of you even growing up, getting into the Marines and then going recon, fairly decisive and in control of your own path. Is that a pretty uh, accurate statement? Yeah, I mean, I, I ever, uh, I guess a lot of people are are afraid to show up and be uh, yeah measured and found wanting. And uh, maybe I, you I, fail. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, then you fail, right? Uh, and for me, I'm the opposite. Like, what if I'm good enough and I never find out? You know, so I have the opposite fear. I immediately uh, leap at challenges to, to see if I'm the guy. Yeah. You know, eventually I had to quit doing that, though. It's, that was my, as I got into, I went to the Q course for Special Forces and got out of that. I was like, all right, no more. I don't want to prove how tough I am anymore. I've done it. <laughs> this is, I just want to, I want to do the job, but I'm sick of going places and uh, not eating and not sleeping. I just want to do the work. I did notice, I think you've had the great honor of going through SEER school more than once and not because you recycled. And it's really fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, they did that. Like, I got it, guys. I understand. I understand it. So, like, but, you know, and after the school, they teach you to, you know, build these little uh, kits in case you ever have to do that. And I threw mine away and I just carry a hand grenade because I'll be damned if I'm doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. All right. Um, just, just before we jump into that first deployment, I guess, what's it like being the new guy coming into a recon outfit? Um, I had one of the, the most uh, profound talks, and I still steal it all the time. Um, at a platoon sergeant, 
um, pass early, and he had the, and I guess he saw it because you know, just like I graduated boot camp, I'm like, I'm green now. I had a, a jump wing said dive bubble, you know, and I, he's like, all right, are you a? He's like, you went to ARS or BRC? And I'm like, ARS. ARS is the harder school when it existed, and everybody knows that. So the one I went to it, is that amphibious um, recon. <laughs> And a seer school, obviously, and I've been to jump school, which is like super unique in the in the Marine Corps. And uh, and I was a combat diver. And and he's like, he's asking me, ticking these off. And then he was like, that's the bare minimum to even walk through that door. So now that you're allowed here, what are you gonna do so that we that we want you? And I was like, I never I never thought about that. Like, no shit. And I I, I think it was a really great talk for me because I was I was pretty proud of myself and that really helped me like oh and he was like hey cool outside of this door you're a super cool force recon ring inside this door you're the new guy and you're gonna you, you don't know shit I was like, okay wow did you end up stealing that later I, I use it all the time and, and, I, I and love it, you, it. yeah so I, I especially you know when I do engagements at the corporate uh, level. Um, I find that's pretty apt. It's like, yeah, you went to Harvard Business School. Great, cool. How long have you worked here? Like, not very long, or you wouldn't be talking to me. <laughs> yeah. uh, like, you don't, you don't know anything about how this works. The, the credentials that you have, while very unique, it's the bare minimum to get you here. So now, learn how to do this job, um, and hopefully, it helps them to, to be humble and uh, to look around and see how how things work. That's great. Yeah. How how long did you have with that unit before you deployed to just kind of integrate and get to know? Them? Not very long. So I, I I think maybe three months. In, wow. In, in, um, and most of that um, was just meeting the, the metrics to be considered deployable as a platoon. Um, so you know, we did a shooting package and a driving package, and. Uh, uh, a validation exercise, and then we high fived and, and went down range. So we did, we really didn't gel and bond as a platoon until we were um, had started working in Iraq. And Where then, did you, you end know, up going? Uh, we went to Al Assad, and then we were the super cool direct action asset for all of Al Anbar. So I've been everywhere in Al Anbar. <laughs> but it's fun one because I'll talk to infantry guys. You know, the, the towns that I went to, they live there for you know. Uh, you know, six, seven months, they were sitting in downtown wherever. And I was there, you know, several times, but like two in the morning. And uh, so we'll tell war stories. And I'm like, yeah, you remember the the roundabout in, in uh, Ramadi? And I'm like, uh, all right, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure I flew over it. Yeah. But, uh, do you remember, could you talk us through the very first time you go outside the wire there? What are you feeling? What was it like? Was it just a regular mission? You hit a house. Uh, so we, I was a, a gunner, and you know, at that time, the IEDs were all the rage. You know, so retro, I know, but uh, I remember being—I was a gunner, and I remember that we had this like uh, class on IEDs, and they're like, "Hey, they hide them. They look like garbage. So if you see garbage, like you know, avoid it." And uh, so I'm like, "All right, I look for garbage." And then I get out of Iraq and it's a third world shithole and all, there's garbage everywhere. So we're like blowing down the road and I'm like, oh, there's IED. Um, and I remember being super like basically just kind of nesting down the turret and like, oh, just, they'll just take it because it's going to happen any minute now. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, drove into the target and the assault force just mounted and hit it. And then we left and nothing happened. And, like, you know, the guy fell asleep watching TV. So he woke up. Um, you know, getting kicked in the face and putting flex cuffs. So no, nothing happened. But I remember being terrified the entire time. Oh, was it day or night? Night or for night. Okay. The only yeah, we almost always went out at night. So. Yeah. Oh man. So maybe on that first, how how long are those deployments? Uh, se uh seven months. Seven. All right. But Marine Corps is really good about adopting that um that seven month um trip. Um, and starting a, a sustainable rotation early. So they, they did a leg up on the army um, by not, you know, I talked to some army units that were there. The first deployment was 18 months long. <laughs> it's crazy. And uh, I had a buddy, he did a, he did like 14 months and they, he flew back to Alaska and the plane landed and it turned around and they flew him. Yeah. 
Can like, you hey, imagine hey, morale on that plane? I was like, well, also, I'm like, hey, your unit that's going to commit war crimes, it's that one. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> if you want to keep an eye out. Oh, jeez. Just a quick word from our sponsor, Give Legacy, and we'll get right back to this combat story. I was really excited to bring Give Legacy to our listeners. Veterans and members of the armed forces have twice the risk of infertility than the general population. Sperm health can be affected by lifestyle, age, injury, and environment, including exposure to toxic chemicals such as those in burn pits, radiation, and pollutants. Hundreds of men in high-risk occupations like police, firefighters, and members of the military use Legacy to test and freeze their sperm. This will allow them to produce biological children, even if the unthinkable happens. The military's healthcare system offers limited options for couples diagnosed with infertility and no coverage for proactive fertility preservation. Legacy is committed to supporting the military, veterans, and their family members. Legacy's special relationship with the military includes several partnerships, including free access to Legacy's privacy-protected at-home sperm testing with one year of complimentary cryopreservation service to all Naval Special Warfare operators and Green Berets, and a partnership with Operation Baby Foundation that provides grants of up to $5,000 to military couples diagnosed with infertility to assist with treatment, surrogacy, and adoption costs. You can find out more by going to www.givelegacy.com. That's givelegacy.com. Listeners can use the code combat story to get 10% off everything on the site. And now back to this combat story. Well, during that first, that first deployment, those first seven months, um, what are one or two of the more formative events that you kind of take part in that um, set the foundation for who you're about to be, you know, <laughs> this, this yeah, career so you're going on? I remember, um, like overcoming that fear. Um, and I, and I having had to do it myself in a, in at least a, uh, I got lucky, you know, so like the violence that I was exposed to, um, came gradually, you know, uh, throughout my career. And uh, I always try to be the, the champion for the guy because the first time somebody shoots at you, you, you just you, you lay there and hide and, and wish that you'd stayed in school. Um, but that, you know, and I was no different. You know, we drove in and, and uh, we call it the, the Iraqi death blossom. Uh, they tried to breach a door with an AK on full auto and a propane tank detonated and scared the rest of them. So they all started shooting all over the place. And that's as we're driving up and I just, I remember thinking like, oh, well, shit, <laughs> I don't want to die out here. Uh, this is, this is way less cool than I thought. And, uh, and, you know, eventually overcoming that and doing the, doing the job I was supposed to be. And then, uh, um, you know, coming off the truck and joining the assault force. Cause that's kind of the, you know, driver gunner, that's new guy stuff. And then being on the assault force is, is where you kind of get to. And, uh, you know, hitting those, um, Hitting those uh, those targets in Iraq and and uh, you know getting getting a harassment fire and then you know kicking somebody's door in, especially you know uh, which is dangerous even in the United States, uh, but in Iraq it's especially dangerous and and uh, but you know kind of giving myself over to relying on my training, relying on my my brothers that are with me and uh, controlling what I can control and, and not dwelling on the stuff I can't um, happened on that trip uh, where I was like wait. If you're if you're one man, you'd be the best, most aggressive one man ever, and because that's how you that, that's how you support your brothers behind you, not by you know coming in, <laughs> wincing, waiting for the hit. I mean, from what I've read about your Medal of Honor experience, there's a lot of that that you're actually applying in real time that we'll get to, like kind of. But, yeah, I, I mean, uh, I uh, somebody, you know when somebody tell me like you never uh, however you, you know you're going to train how you fight, and it's not just at the unit level; it's at the individual level. Um, yeah. So if you're, I know, there's two kinds of combat mindsets. There's the one where you are working through worst case scenarios uh, in training and, and emotionally. Like, what are you going to do if this happens? In deciding, um, and the other one, like it's like, uh, I hope, I just hope nothing bad happens. You know, so they're like they, they're emotionally avoiding dealing with the, the circumstances of. Having to close with the enemy and kill them, and then close with the enemy and getting killed, and uh, you have to settle that and rectify it in your mind if you're going to do the job. A lot of the guys that I interview, there's kind of a moment where they realize I'm no longer invincible, not because they've been hit, but they see somebody else, or they just they've been around it enough. Do you remember such a moment? I I 
I don't know if it was a moment. Um, I think, I think when I became a recon team leader, um, in my opinion, I, I lost the right to ever play it safe. Um, why? You know, well, because as a leader, and you're going to ask people, um, you know, because I'm, I'm a recon team leader. I'm not, I'm not the new commander. Like I have the way to command. I don't have the way to command. I am in charge of guys that I'm there with. Uh, so you don't have the right to play it safe. You have to assume that risk and lead by example, right? So like, you have to be the point man sometimes. Um, you have to be the one man in the stack, especially, you know, the scarier the house, the closer to the front you need to be. Um, and, uh, and, <clears throat> um, and I, I saw a lot of, a lot of PTSD is, is guilt and shame based. Um, and it's not the stress of would they be killed. It's, it's the stress of uh, if I had performed better, maybe this guy would have lived. And so I, I decided, you know, like it's combat, bad things happen. Um, at the end of a battle, I don't want to have any of those doubts. I want to know that like if something bad happened, it just had to happen. And uh, I eliminated that by, you know, being involved <clears throat> in the, the scary parts and, and then also, you know, sweating like crazy and training. But I, I just, I was like, if I survive the battle, I want to survive it emotionally intact. And that was my angle on it. How about just that first time you're the number one in the stack for people who, ha who have no concept of what that would be like, what's going through your mind in that scenario? I, I was, uh, I hope we didn't wake him up before we got here. Uh, number one. Yeah. Do we still have surprise? Do we still have surprise? Because you need, uh, you know, speed surprise and violence of action. And, and uh, the more of those you lose, uh, the worse it gets for you. And uh, I, I remember um, when you're, you know, when you're eight or nine, you get that that confidence of every, as everybody else is going to the house and you don't hear uh, machine guns and, and grenades getting in. You're like, oh, we got them. We've got this. <clears throat> as one man, <clears throat> you know, you don't know until you're uh, fully committed to that. And uh, yeah, a really good friend of mine got, got killed being a, a one man, um, first key. And uh, you know, like he didn't do anything wrong. Uh, he lost his surprise, but that was just the nature of, of that time in the war. And, and as a one man, he, he stepped in, and, and you know, there was like five or six dudes waiting there to kill him. And uh, you know, like but, yeah, I remember. Be on the door and it's like, all right, I hope, I hope everybody's asleep. And uh, if they're not, I have to get out of the way. So they're, they're going to have a, a 200 pound a dead corpse smash into them if they get me. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I should say for people who can't see you, you're a big guy. I mean, how, how tall are you, Earl? Six feet. Six feet. Yeah. So you're not a small guy coming through that door by any means. No, no. Not as big as, you know, some, but bigger than most. Yeah. Um, were you on that, that raid with the friend of yours? No. So we were, we were doing like a port and starboard type and his platoon was heading out, uh, and, and mine had just come in and, uh, we actually went through ARS together. And so I was like, try, I remember trying to talk to him and he, and he, went, he was a newly promoted, uh, team leader in, in third reconnaissance. He's like, I don't have time to, to bullshit, man. I got to get my guys out. And I was like, well, well, I'll catch you when you get back. Cause we, we had just been out for like a month or two, uh, so I was like excited to see him and he went out and, and got killed. You know, you've probably seen your fair share of, of losing guys in different leadership positions. How did you process that? And how did you ever talk to your guys about processing that loss? Is there even uh, anything you can, can say to help? So, you know, guys, um, well, not too much, I think. Um, and I think that's the nature of a, a counter terror type war. It's not like world war two where like a guy got killed and we got a, we got to push on and you can distract yourself. Um, in the CT fight, a guy gets killed, and then you go back to the FOB and don't do anything for two days, you know? So, like, there is a lot of time to just really think about it. And, um, and it's also, um, you know, like, he shouldn't have been here. We should have been here. I'm like, hey, this is an all volunteer force. Um, every single one of us is here because we not only did we volunteer to be here, we fought to be here. Um, there, there's guys that miss the entire war just by, you know, this is a really good time for me to go do recruiting duty, or this is a really good time for me to go to this um, professional development course. And they, you can, if you didn't want to go to war, you didn't have to. And so I was like, anybody that was here chose to be here. 
They volunteered multiple times to be here. They wanted to be here. Uh, they wanted to be here with you. And, um, you know, they, depending on how they were killed, they, like, they got killed um, you know, protecting you. So you don't get to, to dishonor that by, you know, sullying the reasons. Um, and then, uh, and, hey, bad shit happens. It's, we're here to fight a war. We're fighting it. Yeah. And, we, you know, and then also, I, I was, I felt, I thought my own mindset was very resilient. So I was like, hey, he got killed. Did we do everything possible to prevent that? And, and uh, if we didn't, what, what could we do better? Because, I sure would hate to do this again. Yeah. Maybe around those lines of, of learning from something, you know, as you look back with 25 years of a lot of combat, is there any advice you would have given yourself on that first deployment that you know now? Like, are there one or two things you would have said, Hey man, think about this. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, th- I think, uh, Honestly, I think I was in the always in the right place, in the right time, in the right mind, mindset. I guess maybe I was guarding ships. I'm like, hey, you know, calm down. You're gonna get your turn. Or, or hey, <laughs> I went on every deployment like I was gonna die on it. Man, I wish I'd started a 401k when I was 19. Because <laughs> <laughs> now that I have survived the war, I wish I had a larger savings account. Because I I went on every deployment. Uh, dead broke with twenty thousand dollars of credit card debt. Oh. Uh, I didn't want to miss any of the fun uh, in case they got me. So anyway, have half of the fun, save half of it for after the deployment. Well, let's uh, on that note, let's let's transition. You come back from that first deployment. I know, I, I believe you have another one that you do with recon. Yeah, I do, um, I do. so I came back from the first one, um, and I was kind of playing around. What what am I going to do with this force recon thing? And um, it's like, am I, gonna, I could go to the reserve, I could do reserve duty and go to college. Um, and I was like, what am I, am I going to be a full-time guy, part-time guy? Anyway, I, I fell in love with the job. I fell in love with the mission. Um, got, um, you know, ultimatum for my ex-wife. She's like, if you, if you go on another trip, uh, I want to, I'm going to divorce you. I, I went to work the next day and volunteered for the very next trip. So, <laughs> And she's not a liar either. We got divorced. <laughs> but uh, no, that trip, I was like, this is this is my thing. Um, yeah. I like I like this work. Uh, I like uh, the people I'm working with. Um, you know, a force reconnaissance platoon doesn't have any slackers. Everybody is as uh, you know, not just volunteer, but they have like worked their ass off to be there. And uh, serving in a unit where um, everybody is very desirous to be there and, and uh, excel. And uh, a unit that can fire people. You know, when you're in the infantry, if somebody sucks, you have to kind of, you know, motivate them in other uh, interesting means. You know, like, come on, for the big win. No, I'm a nope, I'm bare minimum guy. And a force recon uh, platoon, if you're not cutting the mustard, like, you'll get fired. Wow. And so an organization like that, being able to fire people, um, it, it's a really good, um, it's just a really good way to run an organization. I, I think the, like saying you're stuck here and this guy can't leave. Um, but that was the, uh, that was the big difference between elite organizations and just organizations. Like, it's it's hard to believe. Like, Hey, if you don't like the work, get out of here. Like, we, yeah. We'd rather do it uh, with five guys that really want to be here instead of eight guys uh, just kind of want to be here. I think many people would be surprised to hear somebody could even get through the training. I mean, myself, just having been in aviation and at the agency, people get through who don't have any business, but especially in recon, you'd think it'd be well, so I, hard. Yeah, a lot of elite organizations, you, you got your uh, your sprinters, you know, like they, they really put out when it comes to earning a title or an MOS or a badge, and they coast on the, they, they coast on that performance. And uh, if your organization doesn't have a way to find, like get rid of them, like, oh, cool, you did really good at the school. And that was to teach you how to do the job. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't the key point of performance. Um, and you're, you're going to end up with them. So, like, you know, being able to like, hey, you're not meeting the metrics anymore. Thanks. Uh, please pursue your interests elsewhere. 
what was that second deployment like now that you had one under your belt? Um, it was, you know, it was, uh, cause I went from being a, you know, a super cool four tree gun green and, uh, just really having to do what somebody tells me, you know, right time, right place, right uniform, uh, to being a team leader. And, uh, uh, especially I was a young team leader, um, for the community. It was, uh, you know, I felt the weight of that, like, where like all these guys are going to train how I tell them to train and they're going to fight how I tell them to fight. And if I pick the wrong way, uh, they don't all get to come home. Um, you know, it's, it's nerve wracking, but you know, I, I did it like anything else. I, I don't know how to do it. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll build it. I'll build the wagon while we're going down the road. And right. I had you know really good mentors and I didn't know how to do the job. Um, so I just, Breaking it down the road. When I when I failed, I learned from it. And when I succeeded, I doubled down on it. What was one of the tougher, more challenging moments in that second deployment? So the, the second deployment, um, it was harder to maintain discipline because the uh, it was two thousand eight. The kinetic the kinetic part of the war was was really gone, um, <clears throat> and we weren't doing hits. Uh, it wasn't life or death every night, and really keeping the guys. Uh, for getting lackadaisical, keeping them uh, on point, doing the right things the whole time. You know, nobody wants to get up and, and clean their gun uh, when it's 130 degrees uh, when they haven't even taken their, their rifle off safe for you know two months. Mm. Uh, it's, it's hard to maintain discipline in that environment, even you know, even in an elite unit. And that just drags on. I would imagine it could lead to lead to some friction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's probably. Uh, some of those guys love me and, and you know, half you know, hate my guts, but sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it, where does, where does SF come into the picture then? Is it on this deployment? Uh, um, Is it happening? On, on that deployment. And, uh, you know, I was always kind of struggling in the Marine Corps. Um, cause I, I can see what the Marine Corps would consider cheating. And I was like, wow. This guy goes, to, you know, he's at this coffee house every day. Why don't I just ride a motorcycle down there? And when he gets out of his car, I'll shoot him in the back of the head. <laughs> well, and the, the Marine Corps is like, no, you do a mission, the platoon's going to go down there. And, and uh, anyway, interesting. Yeah, yeah. The, same, the same mentors are like, hey, all the stuff you're saying, um, there's people that do that. Uh, it's just not us. So if you want to, if you want to be uh, in a supporting operation to the most elite, Infantry the world's ever known. Well, rest easy. That's the job you have. <laughs> if you want to be, if you want to be the guy and go out there and and do all this wazoo shit and uh, you know dress up like Haji and uh, like you should go to the army because here's the mission and authorities that everybody has. I've never seen those, and so I saw the mission that um, U.S. Army Special Operations had, and I was like, oh, that's that's the stuff I want to do. So I came back from that deployment, um, took leave, and then I had terminal leave and uh, signed a, a special forces contract. And uh, I was a civilian all night uh, of 2009 for like 12 hours. <laughs> Why not go to the Ranger Regiment? Um, what was the, the decision there? So my decision there was um, that... Uh, like the, even though I, I go I go to drive through Ranger battle every now and then because it, it reminds me of the Marine Corps. I'm like, I know exactly what this is. Um, the, the discipline and the, the training. But uh um I I uh, kind of wanted to go to um, be a tier one guy. That was one of my like SF was really my safety school when I came over here. And uh, so that was you know that lent itself to it. go to SF and then at least if I break my leg in West Virginia trying to Trying to be a, a tier one guy. Worst case scenario is I go back to being a Green Beret, which ain't that bad. Um, and then I just I fell in love with being a Green Beret and never left. Um, you know that very first trip, I was like, oh, this is this is for me. Was I mean it, that's another round of a lot of training. I, you know, from what I understand, yeah, I, didn't, uh, I did not know that the, the Q course was like a year and a half long <laughs> when I, I came over. That was which is for a recon read. You're supposed to. We were constant together and telling us, man, I skipped that whole part. It's like, Green Beret, it sounds great. Let's do this. And and how do you end up, uh, which group do you end up going to and why at that point? So 
when I was a force reconnaissance marine, we had a, a green beret, um, John Nettles. And uh, I asked him, I was like, hey, which group's the best group? Because you know, he was a, a green beret that retired and taught CQB. And uh, he's like, well, honestly, like I can tell you it was my group, but he's like, honestly, if you're the green beret and you're in your group and you don't think it's the best group, you're probably not the guy we're looking for anyway. He was like, he's like, but I'll tell you this, wow. have, your wife, have your wife choose the group because she's the one that's going to live there and you're going to be gone all the time. So my, my wife, uh, you know, it's like, here's where all the groups are. Where, where do you want to live? And she picked first group and 10th group. Okay. So after selection, each group plays a little recruiting movie. And uh, I don't remember what the first group one was about, but the 10th group one, Everybody, it was all snow. And at the very end scene, they had a diver swimming up to a sheet of ice and cutting a hole in the ice and like poking out of the ice to pull security. And I was like, fuck 10th group. <laughs> We're going to first group. <laughs> what, what language do you get at that time? I got Indonesian. Really? Yeah. Dang. I didn't know that it was even a country, um, but I got the language. Uh, you know, they have a, they have a test. Uh, that you take and it, it shows you which language you would learn uh, the easiest. And you know, I got Indonesian. I had a, a buddy of mine that stayed out drinking all night. Uh, and he, he took the test and he fell asleep during it. I had to like wake him up. I'm like, hey. And uh, he did really well on the test and got Arabic. Uh, <laughs> um, when you get to that unit, are you are you considered kind of the old guy now? Or is it generally it's older know. folks coming oh, in? I got to, I got to my team and I was still a young guy. Uh, Damn. Yeah. So you, was I, at thirty on my first ODA, I was still I was still the youngest person on the team until we got a, a couple um, of the pure eighteen X rays that had come right out of high school to the, the special forces school. <laughs> so, I think the average age of my team was thirty nine or forty. And then I was sitting at 30, so. Good spot. Yeah. All right. But it was, and that's what I, I constantly go into. Every time I master an organization, I go become a novice at another one. Yeah. I, I feel like that's one of the things that people probably don't understand as they go up through the military, like all the training, you reset, you're the low man on the totem pole, you rise up, you go somewhere else and yeah. you reset. I guess. If you could take us to that first that deployment, I mean, this is 13, right? Is that the first time you go down with them? Well, no. So I deployed through 2010 till 13, but um, DASADs, uh, the Philippines, um, which are all cool missions. And I actually, it was lucky. I, I really became a real Green Beret, not just having a Green Beret on those missions. And, and our team really gelled. So unlike my first force reconnaissance team where we were like, you know, kind of figuring each other out all the way uh, through the deployment. This one, you know, the, it was a, a very cohesive, well-built package that uh, everybody knew what what to do, when to do it, and, and how to do it. So it was a super high-functioning team that deployed in 2013. Why do you say you got to be a real Green Beret? Because I had just graduated the Q Corps. You know, like my, my previous thing, like, great, you have a Green Beret. That's, you can't even work here without one. So like, what... What do you know about it? Mm -hmm. And uh, it has has nothing in common with being a force reconnaissance marine. Um, we do have a mission like force reconnaissance, um, and so I was really good at that one mission uh, of the many that, that the special forces does. So I was really good at one thing, and uh, I learned how to do the rest of it. Um, and and uh, you know, it's running teams, running um, all of the full band with the missions we do. And because, uh, you know, when we get to Afghanistan, um, the first thing we do is get up, you know, SF is not meant to be used as a unilateral force. You don't sit in ODA to someplace um, like a SEAL team to, to put, put steel on steel. They go as a um, force amplifier. They get um, Afghans, train them up, and then lead them into the fight. And uh, I didn't really fully understand that, you know, and, uh, and I learned that through those trips. Yeah, so you, you had the, you had a chance to do that FID mission, I guess, in, yep. before you got to Afghanistan and and learn what that was like. When you fell in on on the Afghans on that rotation, 
had they already been trained up to some degree or are you getting a fresh group? Oh, so that was a, a big one for me is that they will, we had some fresh guys, but we got, a, um, we had a, a village stability platform and, uh, the Afghan special forces team and those guys, they're former Afghan commandos. And now they're doing that, uh, the Afghan SF mission like us. Um, we have the uh, Afghan national police and, you know, that's like a, a tear down from those guys. They're still good. But, you know, they're a police force or kind of a paramilitary police force. And then we have the Afghan local police. And that's literally guys, hey, the bullets come out this end. Uh, that's a safety. Please use it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that are of, of dubious quality and uh, also, you know, dubious uh, on which side they are from day to day. Oh. Do you end up getting close with any of those, even the commandos? Um, and we were, you know, we were peers. I wouldn't say friends. Um, I think the, the, the cultural divide is pretty vast, um, for us. Uh, we didn't really get all the way nested in. And then also I was, I was a weapon sergeant on the team. So I'm kind of the asshole that, that makes things happen. So it's when I'm kicking people in the ass to, to maintain timelines and, and make them do maintenance, it's a little harder uh, for me to, to make really close friends and meaningful <laughs> connections. I guess I'm not familiar. So you're an 18 Bravo, right? Why do you have to be the hard ass? What is that all that, about? Well, you know, so there's that, that um, you know, assistant ops, you know? So like, I, I'm the guy that makes sure that things happen when they're supposed to happen, how they're supposed to happen. Um, that, is, that is my job. So it's, when we, the team sergeant puts out a mission, we're going to go do this tomorrow. I make sure that, you know, the schedule is here. It says that everybody's getting up and getting showered. If they're not, I make them. Yeah. Trucks are supposed to be staged. If they're not, I make them. So I'm, I'm that force of will on the team, but as a, as a person. So that, you know, by the very nature of that position, you're, you're the asset. Who's your, who's your closest friend on the team at that time? Well, I mean, team was pretty tight. Um, I would say uh, Ben Rizika was our medic. Uh, we're, you know, that was probably my closest friend on, on the team at that time. Um, we're still close. I'm, I'm moving down down the street from him in Florida. Uh, so, you know. No way. That's I awesome. I didn't know that we weren't related. Uh, because of Uncle Ben and, and uh, they're like, oh, we're not we're not related to them? Like, no. That's... Uh, that's just daddy's French work. It, yeah, actually, that brings up a good point. I know we're getting into, uh, obviously, the Medal of Honor scene here, but um, you mentioned you you have kids at the time on this deployment. Yeah, so I have my daughter. My, my son, not yet, but I have my daughter. How and, old uh, is she back home? Uh, let's see here. She was like four. Okay. Yeah. How how does that change your mindset, if at all, on that deployment? Um. So I, I really... Um, try, try not to dwell on that stuff. So I, I really tried to draw a firm line um, from being a, a father and a, a husband and to a you know a combat leader. Um, and you just gotta like kind of leave that stuff behind. Not that I didn't call him or tell him I love him, but you you can't um, carry that stuff around with you all the time, day to day. Um, and and I I did. I did end up, you know, having some guilt over some of the things I did, especially, you know, my Medal of Honor narrative, um, because, you know, I, at that point I chose uh, to put myself in a position I could have not gone down there. I could have left that battle at any time. And, um, you know, my, my daughter asked that, didn't you want to come home to us? And I'm like, well, of course I wanted to come home to you. Um, but... You know, I, I was was there for a purpose. Yeah. I, uh, if I put myself uh, coming home to you as as more important in this mission, then somebody else's daddy might not be able to, to come home to them, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna carry that around for the rest yeah. of my life. What a dagger that is, man! To have your daughter say that oh, to man, you, man, right? Oh, heart. Geez. Of course, I wanted to come home, baby. <laughs> um, can you give us just a a flavor of what the deployment was like up until that kind of fateful day. Um, so yeah, you know, we're out there, you know, doing, doing the good work that SF was doing. 
2013 was uh, some high water in Afghanistan. We were for sure we were winning. Um, there were still you know pitched battles back and forth, and and uh, we had uh, Afghan local police checkpoints all over the place, which the Taliban hated because it eliminated them, their ability to, to freely maneuver um, across the uh, country. So they would they would try and wipe out our checkpoints from one way or the other. And so in the middle of the night, we'd get a call, hey, this checkpoint's getting overrun, and uh, we'd have to figure out how to, how to support them, um, either by QRF or, or flexing. Um, you know, I, as a special forces camp, we had mortars, and you're a, of one of many jobs as a weapons sergeant, you're a mortarman. So we could support them with our uh, indirect fires, but we would try to, try to keep those checkpoints from getting overrun. And uh, training new Afghan local police to replace the ones that are getting killed, and then also conduct operations with the Afghan special forces, uh, doing ambushes and, and uh, limited scale raids to kind of beat the Taliban um, back and keep them off of our checkpoints. And it was at that time that our, our Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major Tony Bell, he flew in and, you know, he's about you know, four foot eight, stomp around the camp. <laughs> Loud, boisterous type of personality that really just you. If if he's around, you know. Um, and usually, you know, your sergeant major comes around screaming your name. You go run and hide. I didn't because I knew that we had been. I had been crushing it as a as a green beret wow. as a team. And I'm like, whatever he's about, probably trying to give me a medal. <laughs> why, why why do you say you've been crushing it? Like how how do, how would you? Uh, I don't know. What what makes you say that? <laughs> um, we had great. All the metrics they were tracking. Um, yeah, we're, we're always supposed to create white spray space, eliminate red space. Um, so we've been just crushing the Taliban in our little, our little district. <clears throat> and, uh, um, and you know, our camp was one of the, like, for VIPs to come see what it's, what it's looking like and how good it works. Our, our camp was that camp. So we have VIPs weekly, like, come look at this, come look and come look how good these guys are doing. Um, so when he was looking for me, I just knew like, I don't know what I did, but I know I did something cool that he noticed. And uh, they were they were closing our camp, and I he's like I, I had two choices: um, I could come work for him at the company headquarters, wow. uh, or go home. Um, and uh, nobody goes to selection to do either of those jobs. Um, but I, I figured deployed is better than not, and so I, I uh, said I would come work for him at the company headquarters. Where that where that attack happens is that at the company headquarters? Company oh, headquarters, yeah. Oh, interesting. One of the more notable things about it is you, you see all these green berets getting valor awards. It wasn't an ODA out in the field; it was the company headquarters. Interesting. Okay, yeah. so can you just as we're kind of alluding to, this is an attack on on a fob right mm -hmm. where this happens. Yeah. Can you give people who have never been to Afghanistan? And I understand it's in Ghazni. I, I flew out of uh, Salerno. I covered Ghazni, Wardak. Very different terrain across that area, but just for people to get an understanding, what was that fob like? What was the terrain around it? Um, so it was it was a, some of the only flat ground in Afghanistan. It was right on the edge of a um, a fairly large and significant city, Ghazni. Um, you know, and we had a major highway that, that ran right past the camp into the city, and uh, it was a fob. You know, we had an MWR. Uh, it was where you rolled through the gate, and you got to leave your guns um, in your tent, your truck. You know. And uh, walk around with just the just the bare minimum for security, and um, you know we had the chow hall, so all the surrounding uh, areas would come on and just kind of relax on the fob, you know, with the full of vomits. We're a fob full of vomits. Regular army, regular He's army. Right. Uh, it was Polish. It was a Polish camp, um, but at this time the the Tint Mountain was drawing out of the country, so we we had a, a fairly significant uh, footprint of Tint Mountain, but. Not consistent. You know, our unit would come in and then um, you know retrograde out of the country. Um, uh, but you know, it was a Bob doing Bob things. It was all administrative and logistical support for the warfighter who were somewhere else. I suppose part of the reason they attack this is so they have an effects on the yeah, so we, in the environment. We did it, you know, um, hindsight being twenty twenty, we, we uh, you know the, that camp was due to be closed that year. Um, and the Taliban found out. So for them, it was a win, a win, win. Either they would come in and just completely, uh, overrun the camp and, and 
force it to be shut down by destroying it militarily, or they come in and hasten the shutdown of the camp by making an untenable position. Um, and then, then they still get to take credit for running us out of town. So for them, it became a, um, a, a there was no way they could lose. Okay. And then just before we get into this event, like any intel that comes in to indicate this is about to happen, any chatter? So we had tons of chatter. Um, you know, we had like the, the Salerno attack and the, uh, so we knew that they did these, these, um, these, these super kinetic complex attacks where they, they bring in all these different assets to make these, you know, grand gestures of these attacks. So we, we knew that was a TTP. Um, and then, and we actually knew the camp was going to get hit that day. We just didn't know the, the significance and the weight that the Taliban was going to bring to bear on it. We thought it was going to be just another indirect fire attack. Um, and, uh, um, you know, and when I say we, the, the polls, because the, uh, the AOB, we have nothing to do with the, the camp security. And we didn't even operate uh, in the area outside of that camp. We were um, a, a logistical node and a command node for all the ODAs that are much further out away from us. Yeah. So we're kind of paying attention to the security situation on the FOB, but we don't, we don't. But you're, yeah, you're looking outside. Yeah, we're, we're worried about stuff, you know, 100 miles away, not yeah. you know, 800 meters away. And we don't play a part in it. So even if we had known that the camp was getting attacked the day of, um, we probably would have just um, limited our activities external to the SF camp um, because we played no part in the security uh, of the camp or the immediate area. Yeah. Um, so, but, yeah, so there was some stuff that was missed and it was just one of those, you know, we had a piece, the polls had a piece and there were some, some other things that multiple organizations had. And if we had the time, you know, we were still all doing our mission that were there in the first place. We probably could have figured it out, but even better, we figured it out the day afterwards. <laughs> I was at Salerno in 08 when our base got hit and you know, it was a crazy doesn't sound, they didn't breach the gate though, the way you described, but it was still a pretty significant event. So, and so you, our, they used yeah. a, they used the, they did an AR of, of this, what worked at the Salerno attack and they, they tweaked it um, for our attack. So they took, Great. yeah. So they took all of, all the uh, attacks that they had done um, and, and refined them to, uh, to make it work. So so where are a, you at on the camp that day as this kicks off? And like, what time of day is this going on? So this is uh, late morning and we're going in. And, and so I was kind of hanging out at SF camp because um, it was a good time of day for the indirect fire, the harassment fires. Um, and it, it, uh, so I typically avoided being off the camp <laughs> um, that late afternoon, early morning, because for whatever reason, that's when we took indirect fire. <clears throat> And uh, there's nothing worse than getting caught on the, the regular army side of the camp <laughs> when, a, when an indirect fire lands because then you're like trapped in a bunker uh, for the whole the whole however long it takes them to, to sort it out. And uh, so anyway, I would just avoid that. And so I was just hanging out in the SF camp. So maybe just for awareness, spatial awareness, if you're looking at the camp itself for the FOB, where are you in relation? Where is your part of that in relation to where the attack kicks off? So we are all the way on the other side of the camp from it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, if, you, if you've ever been there, they have, they have the highway running into Ghazi, and uh, we're on that highway side of the camp, and then this attack happened across the camp at the airfield. So I think our camp was like 1,800 meters from the, from the airfield. Wow. All right. And then what are you, this strange question, but are you like suited up at the time? Cause I think things oh. kick off and they just move rapidly, right? No, so I, I was on our camp. I have a concealed, uh, you know, pistol, a cup of coffee and, uh, just, just kind of hanging out. The only, really the only reason I was able to respond so quickly is we just took a, a photo for the change of command and it's, it's going to be the, the AOB's picture for the deployment. And I didn't want to look like a fob it uh, for the picture. So I, I went and grabbed my coolest sniper rifle and had my kit set up perfectly because this picture is going to be for posterity. And uh, instead of putting my gear up in my room, I just brought it with me to, to hang out at the, um, the company headquarters so I can bullshit with some guys. Wow. Okay, yeah. And I know you've told this a million times, Earl, but could you take us through what happens? Yeah. 
you know, we're, we're hanging out. Like I said, we've been receiving indirect fire for probably two or three weeks at this point. Um, and uh, we're, we're kind of used to it. And we, I thought it was just that tax, that time tax. But what they were actually doing was uh, building a shot card so they could hit things on the camp that they wanted to hit with their indirect fire. And then mapping out our responses uh, to that, to the indirect fire. And uh, anyway, we're hanging out and, uh, you know, the camp or the building. I mean, I didn't know it was the camp at this point in time for the story. The building I'm in gets just absolutely shaken. And I thought we, we had been hit with uh, some form of indirect fire and hit the building I was in. And, uh, you know, asking the guys I'm in there, it was with the, the company medic and then the guy he was treating for, for diarrhea, throwing an IV in him. They're like, they're both fine. So I step outside and it was a clear, you know, clear day in Afghanistan. It was actually kind of nice. Um, and, uh, but now there's like this thick fog of dust over the whole camp. <clears throat> and as I look back over where I can hear, uh, I can hear a uh, small arms fire. I see like this absolutely just gigantic, uh, mushroom cloud. And it, it's, you know, it's like 12, 1400 feet in the air. And I'm like, holy, holy shit, what is that? And, uh, turns out it was, uh, you know, a four or 5,000 pound, um, truck bomb, depending on how they mix the explosives had, had detonating against the wall. And, uh, and I hear that small arms fire. So I know that this is not just, uh, not just a, a suicide bomber. This is some kind of something is happening. So I run and get my gear on, um, I see our Toyota Tacoma pickup. We use it for a mail runner. It comes powering in, and uh, the guy driving it, you know, takes off. And uh, one of our Intel guys from the company headquarters, uh, Nate Abkemeyer, he's like, he screams out, he's driving, and runs and jumps in the front seat. And I, I run over and jump in the passenger seat. And uh, as we're pulling out of there, we almost run over our uh, the company uh, intelligence sergeant, uh, Drew Busick. He's on a four wheeler. And we're like, you know, get in with us, get off that four-wheeler. You're going to get shot up. Can I pause and, you for one second? Yeah. Just out of curiosity. I mean, the fact that this is not your team at that former FOB, like this is the headquarters folks who have been yeah. trapped oh. on a base yes. who are probably itching to fight, I would imagine. Yeah, but no, haven't fought together. Yeah, no. So nobody, um, yeah, nobody wants to be on the company headquarters, not even the, the company no. commander. It's our major. They, if, if they could hit the rewind button, they go back to a team. <laughs> and, uh, so we, we drive along and build an assault force out of the company headquarters. Wow. Okay. So, uh, yeah, the guys I was down there, we only had one person not from the company headquarters, uh, Matt Horde. Uh, he was a medic from another ODA. But we had the company warrant uh, and the company intelligence sergeant, company weapons sergeant, and then our company human guy. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the team we put together. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and one Navy SEAL who was there for the change of command. <laughs> All right. Uh, so anyway, we, we hop in this truck and we drive out. Um, and we pull out and we can see like a, a ton of fire coming from this hotel across the highway. Um, that's, that's the Taliban had um, put, you know, a, a sizable force in there. And they're hammering the camp with uh, machine guns, RPGs, and they have a... Um, four or five water tubes set up, uh, you know, properly too. Wow. They're, they're just letting the camp have it, but the wall's still intact there. And we can see the towers are, 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 are you know, firing back. And so we, we decide, hey, whatever blew up down there, that's where we need to be. So we leave it out of this fire. And uh, that's where I meet up with uh, Matt Horde and, and Chief Colbert. They're, they pull up on uh, next to us in a four wheeler. You know, because we're the only thing out on this road moving around, and we're giving the thumbs up. You know, are you guys going that way? And we're like, yeah, yeah, we're going, we're going too. <clears throat> and uh, we pull down uh, to the last covered and concealed uh, area. And it's the this little uh, road intersection that kind of dumps off of the airfield, and we start to slow down before we nose out there. And uh, you know, Matt and uh, uh, Mark Colbert both just get hit um, by small arms fire, and they're getting getting the shit shot out of them. But from where we are, I can see, I can see where the bomb detonated. I can see this huge crater out in the wall and 
they had a support by a fire position just past it. And I can see them, you know, see that shooting into the camp. I didn't see anybody um, near, so I couldn't really tell where they were taking fire from. But we, you know, we have a battle drill for that. Pull the truck in between the, the fire and, you know, dismount them up the clean side. That's the non getting shot out, shot outside. Um, so I, you know, we, we start that turn to, to block that fire. And uh, I kick my door open. And as we pull forward, um, we pull right in the middle of, of um, you know, seven or eight um, guys dressed in um, Afghan uniforms. And uh, that was the big change for them is they knew that in the past they had dressed up as Americans or dressed up as civilians. Um, and it didn't really work as they penetrated the camp. So uh, they think, well, let's look like Afghan army and that maybe will buy us some time. And, and Earl, did I hear you say, so you kind of drove your pickup in between this assaulting force and you two guys who have been hit yeah. to got to give them some cover. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and as we pull forward, I can see now that where this fire is coming from. Uh, Cause uh, as we pull the truck forward, they all, you know, drop AKs and just start hammering us. Um, and uh, anyway, put, put my rifle out in front and pull the trigger, fire one round. Um, I dump it into the rocks at their feet <clears throat> and my rifle jammed. <laughs> I know, I, I was a huge, it was a huge letdown for me too, believe me. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I've been, you know, I've been hammered as a forestry company and as a, as a Green Beret. Um, that transitioned to the pistol. So like the gun, I felt it go down. Like, I didn't even have to get on the trigger. I'm like, oh, this shit just broke. And so I dropped my rifle and stick the pistol out. And at that point, you know, I, I had about, you know, five or six guys to my front and, uh, you know, two or three off to my left and rear. But I, I figured um, that uh, Nate and Drew were going to have to sort this out. And I, I buy them as much time as I could. So I just started advancing on the enemy with my pistol out, uh, just doing the most stressful El Prez ever. And uh, yeah, I don't, and it, every time I would line up my sights and, and break around, I just figured it would be my last one. And uh, then as I got, you know, closed that gap with them and started running my pistol closer to empty and uh, having effect on the enemy. Um, but then I got right there in the middle of them and my pistol only had like two rounds left in it. And, uh, you know, I was surprised that I wasn't dead and the Taliban was you know, super upset. Uh, so to, so buy some time for all of us to kind of think about what we're going to do next. I, I pulled out a hand grenade and, and uh, tossed it in between us. So, and you said w these guys need to sort out what's going on. Basically they're, they're, hit and trying to recover and you're trying to buy them some time I, I didn't even know that i just i knew that we were sitting there with we had two guys down and i had two two guys in the truck with me and i didn't think i was going to play much more uh part in that particular battle uh so i thought as long as i closed with that pistol i could buy the guys in the truck enough time to uh dismount or pull the truck back do something whatever they came up with because that was that was going to be their part and, uh, uh, how how far are we talking, Earl? Like between you and these guys, you're closed. Do you remember? Uh, so I'm probably 10, 12 meters from, from when I got out of the truck and closed with them. And then, you know, I closed that all the way to about uh, two or three meters um, before I got to like this little uh, tank, water, empty water tank. And then you dropped the grenade. And then I yeah, pulled out the party trick and, and threw a grenade, um, which, you know, <laughs> it kills. It kills every time. <laughs> <laughs> so i mean how far away do you drop it do you drop it and run what's what happens no so i i just dropped it um at the, the nearest fighter you know like i said probably it's probably three meters from me um and i just i blindly just kind of tossed it out there it was um one of the fighters i hit him um in the pelvic girdle i remember it clearly because I, I fired one round and he instantly dropped and you know, you always hear that like the nine mil just doesn't have any stopping power. So like that, that wasn't my experience because I remember clear front side post aiming uh, right as right of his hips, and I pulled the trigger once, and it literally just cut the strings. Uh, but when I threw the grenade, it, it rolled into his belly and just kind of stopped there. Um, and I so I just started doing. I started getting my rifle back up. Um, 
And <clears throat> when I threw the grenade, he picked me up with his sights and you know started firing at me. And so the whole time I was getting my rifle up, that water tank was empty. Um, but you know, so it's <laughs> cover is preferred to concealment, but concealment is a uh, allow them not to directly target you. So I'm, I was sitting there uh, going to work on my rifle and I just remember these, these bullets taken through the tank and little white pieces of plastic uh, falling down. And you're on the other side of it. So I'm on the other side of it. Through. And I'm like kneeling because I got my, I don't have a holster. I was concealed carrying. So I was like fumbling with my rifle and my pistol and like sticking my, trying to get my pistol back in my waistband and then doing the, uh, locking my bolts in the rear and getting you know, the double feet out of it. And uh, get my rifle back up. And when the the grenade goes off, presumably. Oh yeah. On the so other the, side. It, it, he was he was sitting there. Uh, he laid on that grenade until it went off. And uh, you know, I got my rifle up about the same time the grenade detonated. So I, I came back around the corner when that grenade detonated, and I just saw him twirling through the air like a ragdoll, which is not typical of uh, anything I've experienced, other than you know Steven Spielberg's movies. Yeah. Um, what, why did you aim for the hips? Uh, did they, they have armor on? No, just the vest, you know, and, uh, they had a, you know, the nine mil is, uh, it's a pistol round. So even, uh, uh, magazines will stop it. So if anybody's wearing, if anything, if they have anything over it, we were just taught, uh, hips and face, you know, wow. but the hips and then come up to the, to the face. Um, cause even if all they're wearing is two or three magazines. If you hit a magazine, it'll stop the pistol round. So re- really I didn't come up with that on the spot. Yeah. So, and you're counting in your head how many rounds you got? Oh, I wish I was that calm. I I <laughs> had like a a lot of idea that I'm kind of out. So I was like, I don't know how many are left in here, but not many. Yeah. And, um, I transitioned again later, uh, and and I had two. So I was like, pop, pop, and then the cool. pistol. Okay. Uh, but uh, but yeah, was, they had a vest on, so I you know I've been I didn't even think about that. That just happened. So I just yeah. freezed it out. Pelvis, 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 pelvis. And just, um, just drove that gun as fast as I could. When you pop up from behind the water tank, you see this guy fly like a rag doll. Who else is left at that point? Um, so I don't, nobody. It's me and him, and, and he's gone at this point. Because uh, when I threw that grenade, it had the intended effect. Everybody went somewhere else um, um, rapidly. So I, I came back out, and it was actually kind of like, you know, where'd everybody go type moment. And, uh, and then somebody volunteered to help orientate me to the fight by, uh, you know, taking some shots at me. So w- one of the fighters uh, out across the airfield was uh, taking shots. He was about 100 meters from me. And he, he was just out there in the airfield in a, a sling-supported prone position, um, just driving him in like a KD range. And uh, I remember hearing a snap thump uh, of the rounds coming across the nape of my neck and then hitting the hitting the Hesco wall and which will get your attention. So I turned and looked out and saw him <clears throat> drop to a knee, um, you know, stuck my rifle out, but I had a hundred meters zero. So this was perfect. And I, I held on the notch of his neck, pulled the trigger and he just vaporized. It worked. Jeez. Yeah. And, uh, it scared me at first because I was like, why the hell did that guy blow up? And I was kind of I was looking looking around. I thought maybe maybe a tank had come up and, and blasted him. What did you hit him with? I hit hit him with a, a 762 Jeez. Um, you no know, hundred or what hundred one one eight LR. But it hit his suicide vest, which was very sensitive. And uh, uh it hit right. his suicide vest. So um and of course I'm like, yeah, every sniper on the face here wants that in their kill book. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so do, you don't have an M4. Do you have the sniper rifle that you took the picture with? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect gun for most of Afghanistan. Um, <laughs> the automatic sniper rifle. Uh, worst gun ever for, for CQB. Uh, so like when, I, when I presented it out of the truck, you know, I had, I had like a 5 by 15 night force scope on it. So, you know, everybody was really big. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this guy from across the field gets your attention. You take care of him. So th- actually, you know, I want to read this one part of the narrative that really stuck with me. It's a, uh, I think it's a quote that you had. Where is this? Oh, here it is. Um, uh, I'll edit this part out. Just give me a sec. Here it is. It says, 
the strongest emotion I had that day was the last time we were pushing down and it really gotten organized. We were moving as a really aggressive synced up stack, moving right into the chaos. It was probably, ah, it's, uh, a cut off something like that. It was probably the most, uh, inspiring moment of my career, something to that effect. So is it yeah, leading no, up to this point now? No, we're, we're, we're almost there. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Keep going. At this point, this is, this is still, this story is all about me. I'm still, I'm still, I'm still alone right now. Alone but, and unafraid as a Marine. Yeah, alone and unafraid. Well, alone. <laughs> yeah, I, I hit, you know, that guy detonates and I'm, I'm dancing around. Like, I can't believe nobody's here. Cause I was, <laughs> now who's going to know the story. <laughs> But uh, anyway, I, I knew I had a general idea where the rest of these guys ran off, um, and uh, so I didn't know what they were doing. But I figured they didn't plan on me tagging along, and uh, I got friends behind me, so I, I'm I'm just going to stay engaged uh, with these guys and uh, you know wait for help. So I start moving down to where they ran off when I threw the grenade. I get about halfway there, and they they hang muzzles and start lighting me up, and once again, uh, you know. A gigantic sniper rifle and I'm trying to shoot on the move and suppress, you know, three or four guys at the same time. Um, so I'm just kind of giving everybody a little love and, and kind of keeping them behind cover. But, you know, I, I didn't like I said, I didn't have a, I didn't have an M4 with a red dot. So when somebody's leaning out around a, a container and only giving you three or four inches uh, to shoot at, it's really hard uh, when you have a, a giant sniper rifle. And, uh, Anyway, I was, you know, keeping them, you know, I, I'd get them, get it up, get a round or two on them, get them back around cover and then move over to their buddy. And then I'm still advancing on them while I'm doing this. And my rifle ran dry. And I had that, I had that suspicion, you know, I knew I had some rounds left in my pistol, but not very many. Um, and I, you know, and I have all these guys in my front. So I was like, hey, uh, pistol's not going to fix this. I got to reload. I got to do, do a speed reload on my rifle. Um <clears throat> as soon as I dumped the mag, you know, because I have this, you know, stupid sniper rifle, so I super elevated, you know, dumped the mag so I can start the reload. And as soon as I did that, the nearest fighter um, sprinted from cover. Um, I still remember him throwing his throwing his rifle into his uh, sling and just sprinting toward me. Really? And, uh, you know, I figured that wasn't good. <laughs> So I, I throw a magazine in, drop it down in front of me, and just start hammering away, um, and, and detonated his vest, which didn't do either of us any good. But you know, it was worse for him because he was wearing it. Oh. it I mean, oh. as this is going along, you're just trying to stay in the moment, be present, like just rely on the basics. I got to imagine. Yeah, uh, that's so. We actually have uh, critical task evaluations. So that's one of my talks I always do for uh, um, new Green Berets, uh, you know, attending their first CQB school. Is I put that this whole battle together, and I'm really just executing a series of uh, maneuvers that are that are testable. I didn't there was no profound tactics. Um, yeah. It was just me executing, you know, multiple targets in depth, multiple targets in width, um, you know, engaging on the move, transitioning, and, and just doing all these basics, just. You know, doing them better than the enemy, and, and uh, I think the uh, you know when we look back on it, um, from where I got out of the truck to this this uh, junction panel I'm at now, um, uh, they went back and counted all the the holes that they could find, and that's this is in the wall of the truck, not counting the stuff that went to the sky and the ground. But you know that that wall they they found 320 rounds. Uh, in it, and, and this whole gunfight is happening in that that ten to fifteen meter um, line, and uh, I never got hit. Um, and I think that the big difference was uh, the only time I stopped moving was when I was behind cover, and when I wasn't behind cover, I was creating cover with my muzzle, and uh, I had the ability to hit a moving target on the move, and they didn't have the ability to hit a moving target um, even from a stationary position. So, um, you know, as we go through that fight, we're just chipping away at their numerical advantage every time we, we kind of clashed. 
I like how you're saying we. I mean, it still sounds like it's you at this point. Well, there's other guys. They're coming. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, you know, that this guy um, was real, probably like at that five, six meter line. Um, so that, that blast kind of dumped me. Um, oh, that was the, the second suicide vest exploding. Right. And so, um, and I had just kind of eased in behind this generator panel. Um, so when, uh, when, uh, when his vest exploded, it took most of the blast and all the shrapnel, um, still didn't do me a whole lot of good. Cause I, I remember waking up off the ground and, uh, another surgeon was walking up on me trying to, uh, dead check me. And, um, uh, and uh, missing because he was like staring over his rifle, uh, like a doofus. And anyway, I jerked my jerked my rifle up, kind of chicken winged it, and, and uh, emptied the magazine on him. Folded him up, um, fought to my feet, and then you know out of ammo again. So uh, dumped the magazine. Except for this time, instead of um, fighting it out, I'm, I sprinted back down to that water tank where I started this whole shenanigans. As I run around that, I crash into Drew Music who uh, was in the back seat of the truck. Um, when I stepped out to go, uh, he tried to follow me, but just one of those weird things, a, a bullet had come through the uh, A-pillar and hit the child safety lock switch um, in the door. No way. I think, yeah, yeah, super weird. And it was actually, it was just, you know, I've ever seen it in a Toyota. It's like a little, it's a little red wire that just kind of sits in there. And a bullet had come through and just, smash it down so he was safety lost just couldn't get out wow then uh and then when they, when they were shooting at me uh you know they were missing me but they were hitting my seat and the door frame around me um which is it's what happens when you stare at the target so your front side post uh good lesson yeah um anyway th those rounds would would uh you know, hit the seat, hit the armor in the truck and, and come apart. So Drew was just catching hell in the back seat there. So he had, uh, Nate and Drew both got hit um, by rounds that had, had missed me and come into that truck. Oh. Anyway, he saw me go, you know, he saw me and he was trying to follow me and to climb over all the company's mail because the back seat was completely full of all of our mail. <laughs> and uh, find out the other side. And then, so he's, you know, fighting out of this truck and Nate had done a reverse 180 and crashed into a wall trying to get off the eggs. And then he had to come you know, and find me. So that's, that's where he was. And he crams into me. And I'm like, Drew, I know right where they're at. Let's go get them. He's, he's like, okay. And so Drew as the, as the, uh, Intel sergeant for the company, he's been, you know, he's not, he's not going out. So he's got rid of his M4 and he's carrying an MP5. Uh, in case he has to go to the gate or something. So he, he's got, you know, not the best gun uh, for this particular day either. Um, we're, both, we're both pumped and we're in it, you know. So he, he pulls across for me, uh, cross coverage, and we start easing back down uh, to that panel. And, uh, and before we get down there, like Drew's looking like he's going to step over this last fighter. Um, at the end of this little lane, because when I killed him, he fell over on, on Drew's side, and uh, that dude was just sitting there, kind of smoking. And and I was yelling at Drew, I was like, "Hey, don't go near the bodies; they all have suicide vests on." You know, and he kind of you know perked up. He's like, "What?" And uh, anyway, that vest goes low order, which you know it doesn't explode; it just burns. But um, you know, high explosive burns in a pretty brilliant way. So it's it's like a, a giant blowtorch. A uh, twenty foot blowtorch, <clears throat> and uh, so Drew, you know, runs over. We're both behind this generator panel now, and uh, the, the blowtorch has got the Taliban all wound up, so they're shooting at us. And we're we're both you know fighting it out. The, the generator panel is almost big enough for one person, so we're we're both trying to use it as best we can. <clears throat> and uh, and they get the great idea. They all had a belt with like twenty hand grenades on it. So they start operating like a, a rifleman grenadier buddy teams. And one guy will suppress us and the other guy will just start starts pelting us with hand grenades. And uh, I didn't have a good, I just remember everything exploding the whole time. Uh, we went back and looked at the video and we're trying to count how many grenades detonate. And even, even in slow motion, it's kind of hard to tell. But we figured they threw 15 or hand grenade, 15 or 20 hand grenades at us. 
What was the closest that got to you? So they, they actually, um, I got hit uh, right here in the, um, just over my plate carrier. A hand grenade hit me. And I remember looking down and seeing it. And uh, the only thing I can come up with is uh, we had an old uh, reserve parachute. And if it didn't catch air, they had this thing where you were supposed to thumb, thumb the stoves. So that, I just remember like, I never trained for like getting a hand grenade off my admin pouch. So I just started thumbing at it. <laughs> uh, but I, I just started like clawing away at it and it, you know, it rolled off in front of us and detonated. And then I guess when I was messing with it, they threw another one and hit the wall behind us. Um, and it ricocheted around in, in the, uh, behind the generator panel, Drew and I. And so we were both kicking at it to get it out of there. But uh, really, they, they were so amped up. They were throwing the grenades at us so hard that most of them would hit the wall and just bounce off in between us. So it was just as bad for them as it was for us. Jeez. Um, but after after a couple grenades, you know, came back there with us, uh, Drew grabbed me and he, he, you know, he said, we got to get out of here. They're going to kill us. And he kind of drug me sideways with him and... Um, whether it was a grenade or a suicide vest, I don't know, but we both got blown down, um, all tangled up. And I remember trying to climb off of them and, and we're trying to fight to our feet and everything's on fire and everything's exploding. And we, we get up and, uh, run down and come crashing around this corner again. And I'll, you know, we're, we're safe. And, uh, and I was like, perfect. Cause this, this Polish, uh, fighting vehicle pulls up and it's huge. And, and uh, I remember the, the Polish commander sitting and he's like, you know, sitting all the way out, like, you know, his waist, waist up <laughs> out there with his little beret on. It was like, perfect. So I started, but he's not looking, he's like looking out through the breach and uh, he's, he's seeing the support by fire position. And I just start like winging rocks at him <clears throat> and, uh, you know, gets his attention. He shits his pants. He's like, what was that? And uh, I was like, hey, you know, come through here. And uh, he, he looked down, and he said no, and then drove off. Uh, what? I'm super disappointed. Yeah. Oh. I mean, was he? did he end up maneuvering on something useful? No, he drove around the corner, and then the uh, insurgents on the opposite side of that wall shot him in the back of the head as he, as he pulled around. No way. So I, I guess he never figured out that they had already infiltrated the camp. He was so captured in the... The... Uh, uh, crater and the support by a fire position. Uh, and, you know, and it, obviously he probably had been getting shot at for that whole, that whole maneuver up to be with us. We had the hotel on the opposite side of the camp that was probably shooting RPGs at him. So he just got, uh, he got sucked into the threat that he could see and, and just never noticed that. Okay. Dang. Hey, but, I, at this point, it's you, you know, it's the two of you there. Is there any discussion of like, we've done enough, Let's let somebody else fight it out. No. no so as soon as the, that tank drove off, uh, we're like, well, let's, let's go back down there. And, uh, you know, we're kind of like watching. Because um, as soon as that, as soon as that uh, um, vehicle commander, as soon as he got hit and, and fell back down in there, uh, that, that, uh, that vehicle just went berserk and just started shooting everything. So it, it basically did a traverse at the psychic rate with whatever, you know, 30 millimeter cannon that thing had. And, uh, and then those vehicles out there, you can see the RPGs and the, and the uh, rifle grenades smashing into them. So it's a pretty surreal thing to see. I think there's probably four or five of these um, uh, Polish uh, fighting vehicles out there just, just smashing the whole head wow. of the camp. And then, you know, seeing them get hit with RPGs and stuff was pretty surreal too. But you know, they've got that part. <laughs> we'll handle this. Um, the two yeah. of us will handle this. Yeah. We got it. And uh, so we're, we're sitting there and um, um, Chief Colbert comes comes limping up. And I was pumped because the last time I saw him, he just kind of like, had, you know, fallen over. And, uh, and, and you know, I thought he was, you know, dead or at least previously wounded. But uh, anyway, he's got he's got five five buttholes now, one from God and four from the Taliban. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> if you get shot in the ass, it hurts a lot, and it'll cause you to fall over. Oh, jeez! But I'm 
I just remember being super elated. I was like, you know, this, uh, he was originally from my team. Uh, I get promoted on the company. So we always had a, um, uh, a sweet spot for, for Chief Colbert. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was, it was a, somebody I really looked up to. And I was really pumped that he wasn't dead. And was, in fact, still fine. But he's like, what are you guys doing? Uh, we're like, Chief, they're right down here. Let's go get them. And he's like, all right, let's go then. And uh, anyway, and then we have our Navy SEAL, you know, Lieutenant Turnip Seat comes running up. Um, so he and, he and uh, uh, Chief Colbert, he wasn't Chief Colbert. This is our first class Colbert for this part of the story. They take that outside lane again. Um, you know, Chief and I take the uh, the inside, and uh, I'm like, mm. I keep running out of ammo. I better top off while we're back here. And uh, so I go. I can't find a magazine. I pull the one out of my gun. And there's only one round in it, uh, which yeah, not that good. So I, I put it back in, and I tell you know, I tell Chief, I'm like, hey, you got to take point. <clears throat> and he's like, why? <laughs> I was like, I only got one bullet. <laughs> you take point, I'll cover you. Uh, and I think he was, he was like, cool. Thanks. <laughs> you know, he limps up in front of me, uh, takes point, And uh, a kid from the uh, 10th Mountain comes running up and he's like, hey, can I, can I come with you guys? And I remember looking at him. He had uh, uh, Oakley's on. That's about it. Uh, no, no kid. He's got a M4 with one mag. And I remember thinking like, you only got one mag, you know, get out of here. And then I was like, well, that's pretty bold talk for somebody that's only got one bullet. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's pretty bad, but come on. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So we, uh, we go around the corner together and, uh, um, not that it's like calm, you know, cause the whole camp's still catching hell, but this part's not that bad anymore. So we get down there, there's dead bodies or bodies, there's dead stuff everywhere because you know everybody had a suicide vest on so there's not um, really a, a corpse that you would recognize there's just pieces and when you really look at them you're like i think that's oh uh, shin you know uh, Jeez. and uh um there's nothing going you know and then you know chief colbert's like i, I think you guys got them all and uh right right when he says it you know the, this this dude sits up out of a meat pile Screams out Akbar, bounce passes two hand grenades at us, and uh, you know rips rips his lanyard and goes wherever they go after they do that. How far was he from you? Uh, probably you know that seven ten meters. What? And uh, and uh, and mostly he was behind the sea container, so his suicide vest really wasn't that big a deal for me. I barely noticed it, um, but the hand grenades, you know, were <laughs> bouncing. And uh, I, I saw where one went, and I didn't, I didn't know where the other one. So I remember, like, if you, you know, I, it's just as likely I'm going to run to wherever that other one was if I decide to run away. So I remember just kind of tucking into the wall, and uh, also just being profoundly confident that nothing was going to happen to me because I haven't got hit this far. So I was like, I'll be fine. Anyway, I'm, I'm sitting there against the wall, and this grenade comes, doink, 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 doink. Um, like right next to me, probably, you know, five or six meters. Uh, this thing is sitting on the ground. I was like, ah, I'll be all right. And why I thought that, I don't know. But I remember, it's like, I don't have eye pro on. I better not look at it. So I just turned my face into the wall and the grenade detonated, uh, which it hurt, you know, it was painful, but I didn't, nothing hit me. And so I, I came just back Just the blast the was painful. Just the blast. I remember hurting in my femur. Wow. So, uh, I remember my bones felt like they were like cracking. And, uh, and, uh, but, you know, I was, you know, wiggling around. I was like, all right, all right, I'm still, I'm still ready to go. And, uh, you know, I get, put my gun back up and I'm like looking where everybody went because I can't find anybody. Because as, as soon as he bounced past those, those hand grenades, you know, everybody went everywhere. And, uh, I was trying to figure out, you know where where Chief went and where where uh, Drew and the and the Lieutenant Sir Turn Seat had gone because they had kind of rounded that corner where the guy with the suicide vest was. And uh, as I'm kind of figuring that out, uh, I see Drew step out and, and he's 
got his MP5 on full auto. And I just remember seeing a super cool arc of brass. And then I was noticing that he was shooting behind me. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's bad. And I could hear an AK going off behind me. And I, I turned around. And uh, one of the one of the fighters has run all the way around us and attacked the back of us. And uh, so I pulled my rifle up, you know, hammered my last two rounds. And uh, whether Drew and I hit him or whether he just decided to uh, detonate his vest, um, don't know. But he was most of the distance. He was probably within uh, a foot or so of uh, Mike Aulis from the 10th Mountain when his vest detonated. And uh, which blew Mike most of the distance uh, from where he was at. Because when the grenades landed, I think he kind of cheated back toward where we had come from with uh, another Polish soldier that had come with us. And so he caught um, most of it. And then afterwards, we found out both those guys, when, when, when that insurgent was um, emptying his bag, he, he shot the shit out of those two at the back of the stack. Jeez. But anyway, I was still amped up. I had my, I knew my, my pistol was empty because I had uh, I'd emptied it when Drew and I were back on that second run and uh, had my, my rifles empty. So I had my, I had my knife out. Was dancing around with that, and uh, I was like, kind of thinking maybe knife fighting guys with suicide vests isn't the best way to participate in the battle. So I put my knife up and I just ran and um, grabbed uh, Staff Sergeant Hollis and started uh, dragging him back into an area with cover and concealment to, to start treating him. That's the tenth mountain guy. Yeah, and I didn't know how bad he was injured, but I just figured it was going to be. Uh, severe. Just out but, of curiosity, do you not try to cross load? Like, would you not ask one of the guys for their mags in that situation? Is it poor form to ask for that? Because oh, you know so they I need was, it. I was asking everybody for ammo, but I had a sniper rifle, and everybody else had M4s and Drew had an MP5. So I actually I link up with Drew a little further down the story, and I'm like, "Do you have ammo?" And he's like, "Of course." I was like, well, "Give me some." So he goes in, and he's got one mag with seven rounds in it. Uh, and you can see he's like looking at it, and so he he strips off one nine mil round and gives it to me. <laughs> and so I, I load, I got one round in my pistol, <clears throat> and uh, and I wouldn't grab an AK, but uh, but anyway, I, I, I grabbed Mike, and uh, he he looked up at me, and I was like, Holy shit, this guy's uh, still alive. Um, and uh, anyway, he looked up at me and then he just kind of relaxed. And I, I drug him back into cover and, and I started treating him. Um, and I was like, you know, maybe having a weapon sergeant uh, treat you is not the best way to, to survive this encounter, but we're on a fob and I can see the hospital. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and there was a, a civilian contractor in this, I was at a UAV compound and uh, he grabbed a vehicle. We get Mike loaded up, and uh, he drives him around to the hospital. That's uh, great. Yeah, I mean, I think he got to the hospital like 90 seconds after he was wounded. Um, unfortunately, he you know, succumbed to his uh, wounds. So, <clears throat> but yeah, so you know, left me on the battlefield still, and uh, and you know, these guys get sucked into the fight with the score by fire position. They didn't know where I ran off with um, Mike Aulis. So when I when Mike drives off, I'm alone again. Um, but I got my knife, and uh, I run over and grab an AK, and of course it's shot to pieces. And I grab another one, and it's shattered from you know, a suicide vest. And I find one that's in pretty good condition, except for the bolt has a bullet hole through it. And I, I run back to one of the others and, and grab a bolt. So I build an AK, <clears throat> grab some mags, and. Uh, start uh, engaging uh, the support by fire position because they all had just a ton of munitions. So I'm just all over the ground. There's um, grenades for the underbay launcher and I'm finding them like, well, this one's in pretty good shape and being, you know, winging them out there. Jeez. How familiar were you with an AK at that time to be able to operate? Uh, it, very. So like yeah, I, okay. As a weapon sergeant, hey, you, you get yeah, good point. beat yeah. over the head with all foreign weapons. And being in Afghanistan, uh, when we train up those militias and their guns are just junk. Um, and so every day I was like working on an AK, trying to make it uh, function properly. Okay. And so I remember 
I took a hundred AK 47s to the range one time and I was just out there trying to get them all to work. Right. And I'd shoot one, it would malfunction. I would diagnose it. I had have, have my tools, I had a little Dremel tool and spare parts kit. I'd get one working. And that's, that's just what I did all day. Okay. Day. Okay. So, very, so I picked it up and just went, went right to work with it. Okay. So you're advancing at this point. You you got your support by fire still wondering where the yeah, hell you are. Yeah, the support by fire out there and the poles are, um, which, you know, luckily my, my com- incoming company commander, he didn't have anything to do. So he, he saw that whole fight. And so he's run down across the camp too. Um, and he's like, I'm not the com- We haven't had a change of command. I'm not the company commander yet. <laughs> And uh, he runs up and he's like, what do we got? I was like, you know, I tell him, I was like, they got a support by fire position. Let, let's go get it. And he's like, well, we'll let the poles handle that, which makes sense because they had a bunch of armored vehicles that are just absolutely decimating uh, anything that even looks at them sideways. Yeah. I was like, well, <clears throat> also this whole area, we have no idea how many insurgents came in. Uh, we should probably clear it. So he and I just start clearing um, all the, these multiple UAV compounds and then the, the tents and hangars for the aircraft. <laughs> and we start clearing around and eventually bump back into Drew, Mark Busick, and uh, Lieutenant Term Seat. And they're doing the same thing we are. They're, they're, they're just looking to get back into the fight, but we can't find any enemy to fight. Did you and, find anybody when you were clearing? Oh, yeah, we found people all over the place. Um, enemy? No, no, just people yeah. okay. sheltering wherever they were at. Um, and then, you know, like, Do we, you got to take me somewhere safe. I'm like, I don't know. There's nowhere safe, man. You might as well stay here. <laughs> just <laughs> hang out. Yeah. Oh, wow. And then, uh, anyway, the, the incoming company commander uh, was like, well, I, I think uh, I think the polls got this. Let's. I think the best thing we can do is get out of the situation. Like we're we're just maneuvering with no no comms with anybody. Let's get off the battlefield and let them sort it out. Yeah. So we Jeez. did. Jeez. Dude, what is your immediate thought after this hellacious battle? Uh well, you know, I can still see the fight out in town. So I I assumed uh we still had more coming toward us, or at least we were gonna gonna have to assault out in the town. To get them off the camp, so I I ran over and topped off on mags and and frags, and I grabbed a ton of magazines because I've been <laughs> like I don't want to run out of ammo. I'm again. not doing that again. And uh, you know, tell my sergeant major we you know he's he's a uh, he's out walking around. I tell him what happened. You know, I tell this story. He's a professor, and he's a like, girl. No one's gonna believe that story. Uh, take. Uh, take Jessica. She was our combat uh, camera soldier. He said, take Jessica over there right now and uh, take pictures of everything because uh, nobody will ever believe that that happened. Wow. And, and so we did. And uh, was actually, you know, one of the reasons that, that uh, there was any dollar rewards is we had all this, all, all this um, army photography from about, you know, three to five minutes after the battle uh, when, when, you know, corpses are still on fire and the blood's still wet. And she came through and took pictures of the whole battlefield. And it sounds like you also had cameras, I would assume, on on the compound. There was a, it's the most frustrating video to watch ever because it's a uh, it's a camera, and the uh, the camera operator when the camp got hit ran to a bunker. So it's it's on auto pan. So it it comes in and you see us leaving, and it, and then the first time it tracks us into the battle, and then you can see the battle start, and then it pans off. <laughs> And then it pans back and you can see the Toyota with all the doors open. And uh, uh, I remember, I was like, oh, I forgot something happened. Because when I was down there by myself, one of the reasons I, I elected to run back was this 500-gallon a- aviation fuel tank exploded. And, and it made like this huge, uh, thick, black smoke all over. It was like perfect. So I ran into that smoke. And I forgot that I even did that. But the camera pans and I see like this, you know, little baby detonation of fuel and I'm like, oh yeah, that, I forgot that happened. <laughs> and it's like, so it, it goes back and forth over the fight and you're like, you're seeing like this huge amount of kinetic activity and that's like where Drew and I are like uh, slowing the video down, trying to count the grenades detonating and then this 
camera just slowly pans off of it. And you're like, come on. Yeah. Oh, jeez. But, but yeah, that was, um, the, uh, that video, um, validated all the sworn statements, you know, a thing, the things were blowing up when the sworn statements said they were blowing up and, uh, and her video, uh, um, you know, the brass and the, the bullets were you know, where they were supposed to be. And it was actually uh, the Secretary of Defense, uh, Esper. He came and did a uh, walkthrough of the battlefield. And when he was walking through, and I'm telling him the whole story, and I'm like, I was standing here and threw my grenade. I actually looked down and, the, and that, through that thick gravel, I see my grenade pin. So I actually found my grenade pin uh, as we were doing it. I, like, I, grabbed, I was like, oh. No wow. shit. Keep that. Yeah, it's a keeper. So that night, once everything, once you know everything has died down, who's the, like, do you call your wife? Do you send an email to a friend? What do you do that night? So uh, I actually, um, when I got blown up, I, I herniated like five discs in my back. So when I took my gear off that night, I got like, these hellacious back spasms. So I got a, a narcotics ride. So I went, I slept all night. Everybody else had to stand, stand to it hundred uh, percent. Drew and uh, uh, Chief Colbert were like, considered walking wounded. So they got put into a tower uh, and had to do, <laughs> had to do hundred percent security all night. And, uh, you know, Chief got shot through the ass so he couldn't sit down. So he said he was like standing up all night. <laughs> security. And uh, we're out of it. We're right? very curious. Like, where's Earl at? And, like, oh, he, they gave him narcs and he's asleep. He's like, he didn't even get hit. Why is he getting narcs? <laughs> Had your wife heard about this by the time you were able to no. talk to her? So I, they, that next morning, you know, because I, I did get wounded. I got a, a piece of brass from one of the suicide vests from his magazine. It, it stripped that round out of his magazine. And I got hit in the arm by a, a piece of brass. Um, or steel, it's it's a green steel that the Russians use. But uh, so I had to call her and tell her, and I don't really tell her. I, I'm like, hey, I, they're making me call you. It's a formality. I got, I put a bandaid on it. Nothing big happened. Yeah. So so I don't want to tell her that story. You know, I don't tell my wife my stories while I'm deployed. Um, because also, you know, I told her when I went to the B team, I was like, hey, babe, don't be lying awake worrying about me. I'm on the, I'm at the company headquarters. Uh, Sergeant Major said he's never going to let me go out because um, that's not my job anymore. Uh, so Nothing to worry about. Rest easy, you know. So I, you know, <laughs> I by the way, the camp almost got overrun. Um, and so I, you know, and I'm still on narcotics, so I, I'm just I'm hanging out with the Sergeant Major most of the day. It's like I'm not allowed to, to leave our little camp, and uh, and I can't walk very far anyway because my back's uh, a train wreck. So anyway, I'm just sitting there hanging out with Sergeant Major. Like his collateral duty was to keep me out of trouble because I'm I'm high on <laughs> Vicodin. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he's like, "So, how'd your wife take you know the news?" And I was like, "Well, I didn't tell her. I just told her, you know, superficial, no big deal." And uh, I remember he he like looks down. He's like, "Girl, <laughs> they're gonna read the narratives at the company barbecue today." Uh, back in Fort Lewis, and I was like, it's like, you better call her. If she finds out from all the other wives, she's going to be pissed. And so I it's grabbed good advice. Yeah, so I grabbed the sat phone and called my wife, and she was actually in the parking lot at the company uh, area going to this barbecue. And I'm like, hey, babe, you know, get back in the car. I got to tell you a story. <clears throat> and uh, sure enough, you know, uh, you know, I talked to her later. It's like, I'm so glad you told me. Is everybody knew if I found out uh, <laughs> somebody else's wife, I'd have been pissed. And I'm like, well, that's why I try to keep you informed because I don't want that to happen. To you. you know, you haven't mentioned any, and I know I got to get you out of here soon. So I, I promise I will, Earl. You, you haven't mentioned anything religious necessarily, but I mean, 300 rounds missing you, several suicide vests, any thought in your yeah. mind, like maybe I'm meant to do something later in life? I mean, obviously. Uh, you have that, or you know, I paid attention to my training and it works. But uh, I did have my mom call probably two days before the attack, and uh, and she said, "Hey, I'm I have a, a ladies' prayer circle at church. I'm going to pray for you, but 
if any of your guys want their names mentioned in our prayers, uh, just tell them, tell me. And, uh, and I remember asking uh, some guys, I was like, hey, my mom wants some names for the prayer circle. And, you know, guys like, no, nah, don't worry about it. And then after the battle, you know, uh, uh, guys were like, hey, call your mama <clears throat> and tell her she's got to pray for everybody or nobody. We can't do any more battles like this. <laughs> Jeez. Um, and then I guess just the last bit here. How, how did that event change how you thought about going into a battle the next time, if if it even happened? Uh, I mean, so I I used to have, and they're very common, I used to have the same nightmares um, before deployments and especially during them. And it's the it's kind of the play on I got to school with no pants. Um, either I'm I'm on the battlefield and I shoot guys, and the bullets like uh, don't have any effect. Like you'll shoot a you'll shoot a, a guy and he falls down and he gets back up and, and you slowly just get overwhelmed. Or uh, you're wandering the battlefield with no ammo. Um, and uh, and they're very common. You know, first responders have their own little play on them. And I, and I used to have those dreams all the time. And and for me, I came out of this battle. Um, just supremely confident. Um, I never had that nightmare again. Because I you know, confronted that that beast uh, and and uh, you know came out successful. And so I, I never I never just never had that nightmare again. And and, uh, and always my two cents to the uh, to the, the younger guys is, is how better prepared I was than the enemy uh, that day. Uh, I had. Even though I had the completely wrong rifle, I had the, the, the worst thing you could possibly take to a close fight. It's a $10,000 sniper rifle. But uh, the, uh, just the, uh, that my training, my preparedness was so much better than theirs. And then my always, you know, give to those young guys is like, you have the same training I have. So when you're on the battlefield, be bold. Yeah. Uh, there, there is no way that you're equal out there. Interesting. There's a, there's two questions or I try to ask everybody at the very end of these. Um, one is, is there anything that you carried with you when you were downrange outside the wire that had sentimental value, good luck charm, religious token, something that somebody had given you that you just wanted to have nearby? Uh, I, I stole my Strider knife from the Marine Corps when I left. So I always keep that on me. <laughs> <laughs> Was that the knife that you pulled out when you were like, all right, maybe this is uh, it. Uh, so I didn't put my gun belt on before this battle. My gun okay. belt was uh, it was in the truck. So I I had a whole I didn't fit in the truck that good. So I threw it. I had a, a satchel that had spare mags and a, a radio, and my gun belt were actually in the floorboard of the truck. So I had a pocket knife when I did that. Um, All right. Yeah. And then, and then the last question is just looking back on you know, several deployments, 25 years of service, a lot of sacrifice, obviously what you just talked about near death, but also the sacrifice with the family, the challenges. Would you go back and do that again? Oh, in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Now, the only thing keeping me from, you know, serving a hundred years is, you know, I can't really tie my boots if uh, cold weather moves in. Uh, <laughs> that's huge broads, huge liability. Oh, man. Earl, this has been a blast. I can't thank you enough, you and Roger, for just making this happen. Um, I know you've had to tell this story a lot, but I, I just appreciate it. It's an honor to sit with you for a period of time. Is there anything else we could share with people, how to find you, anything you're working on that you want to put on people's radar? Uh, yeah, I'm working with the uh, Medal of Honor Foundation. Um, we have a, a character development program, which basically we teach civics uh, to uh, – to uh, high school and below students. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty profound. A lot of school curriculums took the civics out. So we're always looking for donations to make that work. And uh, it's really neat to go and explain to, to students, you know, you, you build a country, the country doesn't build you. And a lot of them have never heard it. Yeah. Then, we'll, get uh, the, we'll get a link in the description Roger, here so people Roger's can help. Giving me my tie in. I have my own website. If you'd like to hire me. Yeah. Uh, to come speak, I have it. What is, what is the website? EarlFolmley.com. If you'd like to hire me to be a motivational speaker for you, I, I also do that. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Hey, hey, thank you so much, Earl, um, just for everything, the time with us, what you've done, uh, what you continue to do. I know retiring from the military is probably just the start of 
a whole lot of things for you with this mantle you're taking up. So thank you. Matt, pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that combat story. It's not every day we get to hear from a Medal of Honor recipient, a very gracious guy, Earl Plumley. Um, you should definitely check out his Instagram. It's It's got some funny stuff in there, just uh, some comedic relief from a guy who's got to be pretty serious a lot of the time, um, but has a much lighter side for sure. And his, uh, his partner in crime, Roger, was sitting just off camera during the interview. He helped us organize everything. He's kind of the, the right-hand man there helping Earl make sure he can get everything done. So uh, with that, just a couple comments. I had uh, one from the uh, Mike Paco Benitez interview, and and this is from Jim D77 on YouTube. He says, I can't believe I have seen dozens of combat story videos, and it just tonight occurred to me that your name literally means Ryan Flies. How cool is that? Guest is a super cool character. I want him with me during the zombie apocalypse. And what, uh, what Jim here is saying is, my last name is Fugit, which in Latin refers to uh, flies. So if you've ever heard the phrase, Tempest Fugit means time flies. So you can look at it as Ryan flies, and there's definitely a lot of flying in our uh, blood. So that's where that comes from. And then there was another great comment on the interview we just released with Glenn Korn, the uh, longtime CIA legend. And this is from Good win Sooners 3520. And he says, Ryan, brother, you somehow get the best to ever do it, spanning all sorts of services. I cannot thank, think of anyone else who pulls this caliber of guests. You have given my daughters and I hours of bonding time, all while expanding their knowledge of how America works. <laughs> I can't even believe you've got your daughters listening to this. Not in a bad way. I just, I figure there's any number of other things that they could be doing, but uh, if they can be listening to this with their old man, that means a ton to me, and uh, certainly we're all learning a lot hearing from these heroes. So thanks so much for leaving that comment. It means a ton. I know it, it takes your time to leave it. Thank you for doing that. Thank you, everybody, for uh, sticking it out this long. Don't forget, we've got a, uh, a newsletter if you're interested at combatstory.com slash newsletter, and you can always support us at patreon.com slash combatstory. So thank you so much, y'all, wherever you are in the world, and whether it's uh, you're rounding out your week or weekend. Hope you stay safe. Thank you.